If you're sitting or eating or painting or driving, you've come to the right place. You've come to Trapped Under Plastic, the podcast where two ambitious persons put their maximum effort to entertain adults still playing with little toy soldiers. That's you. You breather, you pooper, you painter, whatever you're doing right now. <laughs> like, but what we try to really do is not make it seem like we're ambitious. <laughs> yeah, the, the the bar is set low. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The 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 long con here, goody peepee, is is that we we do in fact um, work very hard, but we don't want you to think that. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we don't work really hard in this podcast. Yeah, other places we work hard. I just felt like this week I had to work so hard because, as you can probably hear it in my voice, I am getting over the sickness. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've had some some form of, of viral entropy inside of me. <laughs> oh, hey, I'll arrive right there. Yeah, and I did do an at home test. So I had, for COVID, and it came back negative. So y'all need to not worry. I'm not gonna kill Scott with the Ronas. The but Ronas. This whole week, I've just been like, it's so hard to get any kind of energy, and so I'm like, I'm like, God damn. I feel kind of good that like usually I do this much work in a week and 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 now it feels like this is that's so hard to do this much. So uh yeah, it's okay to take a break. Yeah, it is. You I know? don't I feel bad. I know. I feel bad. And I know you got like sponsors like lined up and stuff like that, but like you yeah. know, I kind of had this realization that like you can at the end of the day if they're dissatisfied with like how you're doing as a person, like you can just refund them their money. And yeah, that loses you a sale, but then, then you are no longer beholden to them. And you can take the time you need to just you like heal up, get better, and then come back at full strength. Yeah. Ironically, the video, um, which should be out now for those uh, goody pee pee listeners and, and watchers, um, two days ago, so today we're recording on a Friday, uh, two days ago on Wednesday, I reached out to them and to just confirm the, the script for the ad read. And they're like, um, it was one of these middleman companies that you work with. And they're like, um, actually, uh, they paused all of their advertisements till December. This was this decision was made in September. And I'm like, hold the fuck up here, buddy. Uh, I was never told any of that. And uh, so I just don't have this advertisement. And they're like, you can do it in December. I'm like, fuck, fuck you. <laughs> so... But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Let's get to the other exciting parts. How about the fact that it's friggin' snowing outside? Yeah, yeah. We live in Minnesota. It is October. It's like middle of October. And there's <clears throat> driving up here, it's like snowing. There's snow all over the roads. There's snow all over the roofs. Not okay, Minnesota. Not okay. Not okay. <laughs> like it's not even Halloween, man. Yeah, what the heck, dude? Yeah, I wanna go I don't want to go trick-or-treating with my snow boots on. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, that was always kind of a lame thing whenever you wanted to like go out when you, as a kid to like trick or treat in Minnesota and like you couldn't like wear a costume or like you had to wear like a, a jacket over your costume because it was like so cold. Yeah, the key is to design your costume as a kid as to it can be weared with layers. Yeah, so this is a skill we learned as children in Minnesota. Right, right, yeah. Costume design skills. Vampires are always strong because you can always throw a big ass cloak. There you go. Over... Your snow pants <laughs> and your winter jacket <laughs> books you out a little bit too, yeah. so your ten year old legs don't look like fucking toothpicks. Yeah, there you my, go. My daughter recently had this conversation with me when we were walking back from the bus stop the other day, and she's like, "I think I want to go as Little Red Riding Hood," and she's like, "Because then I can have a big hood on and a in a in the cape, and I can have a stocking hat on underneath the hood." <laughs> okay, like you're thinking ahead, dude. Okay, I was joking about kids in Minnesota actually thinking about that because I didn't when I was little, but that is hilarious that yes. she actually. He said that yeah she's oh my gosh she's she's felt the stinging winds <laughs> <laughs> the frozen tundras all right a little bit of preamble ramble up in here um i played kill team for the first time and i played the batman miniature game for the first time and i have some thoughts about batman. that batman uh i think kill team um I think both of the games are like great skirmish war games. Like if you like either of those IPs, you'd be very happy playing them. Cool. I think Batman miniature game maybe has 
a sm just a, a smidge, a smidge of rule bloat. There's a lot of keywords, a lot of special effects on every single card. Maybe I was also playing a complicated uh, crew. I was playing the uh, Mr. Freeze crew, and I was told that that was one of the more complex ones. Maybe that was just because I was playing that one. Uh, but there's kind of a lot going on. But, you know, if you like a denser rule set, if you want to like a more denser Marvel Crisis Protocol, it kind of feels like it, that's what it is. Um, Kill Team, you got a little bit of weird GW quirk in there. Mm. Like, instead of using like one inch, two inch, three inch, it's like triangle, square, circle. Oh, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. And like even the gauge has like that symbol on it and all the literature uses that instead of one, two, three. Are you guys too dumb to know what numbers are? <laughs> You're some shapes. You <laughs> Use the triangle stick. Yeah, put the square shape in the square hole. God. Yeah. Why? I don't know. So there's that, but also the rules are like written just kind of poorly. Um I understand that they're trying to maybe circumvent like rules as written kind of people, but the thing is you can't try to cater to those people because they're always going to fuck with your rule set. Yes. So I feel like you should write it for readability and then FAQ for those like kind of more curmudgeon-y people um, because it just makes reading your rule book just a terrible experience. Um, the gameplay itself is pretty good. Terrain, line of sight rules are kind of confusing. Don't really understand how those work. Um, but I am definitely looking forward to playing it again. And you'll find out why. I mean, yeah, this is, I mean, this is supported in what I painted this week. Yeah, spoilers. You painted a lot of a lot of models. Uh, yeah, more definitely more than I normally do. And, uh, uh, we're gonna discuss this. Yeah, but yeah, that was uh, that was uh, that was me. Okay. So around. first of all, I I got questions. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I assume that if you did the Mr. Freeze, what are they called? Squads? They're called crews. Crews. Yes. Um, <laughs> you you did this live on, on Twitch. You played this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how many, <laughs> plus or minus 500, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Mr. Freeze quotes were in the chat? You know... It's shockingly how often you say words like chill and cool uh, just in like regular speaking. And so there were many. There were many uh, references, yeah. like unintentionally and intentionally. Uh, there was a lot of like, I had polar bears in my crew. People were saying things like bear down and stuff oh, like that. God. Like uh, There was a lot. Uh, plus or minus 500, I think we're firmly in the, the, the 3,500 range. Okay, good. You know, I, it, 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 was, it was solid. Solid representation of uh, Austria. Right. Okay, so you've not seen that movie, Batman Forever, or uh, have you? I have, yes. With Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yes. Yes, I have seen that one. I think that's the worst Batman movie ever. I'm or pretty the, sure. Or the best. Or the, yeah, I guess depending on your perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what you're looking for in a film? Look, I, I I agree with those that believe that there should be the the far ends of the spectrum are the most interesting parts of life. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm kind of there right now in my movie career. Yes. Yeah, and and that one certainly is not in the boring gray middle. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Okay, Batman Forever. So yeah, that there was uh, used to be some great soundboards back in the day on E-Bombs World of of all of the. Uh, Schwarzenegger quotes so you know someone would, would call you up and uh oh, yes and, you, know, you just go like you put it next to the computer and be like chill out yes <laughs> that is such a classic internet video oh man okay all right I, okay that was my first one the second one had to do with kill team um I'm, I'm excited I want to play that game I want to there's a couple of different um like Groups, dude. That, who are you feeling? Like Who's number one right now for you, though? I'm so curious. Um, I kind of like the new, the new sculpts, the new models, the new orcs. Oh, I like, I the like Terrius box. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I also like Deathcore Krieg models a lot too. Wow. I feel like I've never heard that from you. I would never have guessed that in a million years. Oh yeah, that's that's a that's a little bit of me. It's, so fortunately, they're both in the same box. <laughs> I know. Maybe I should just buy that box. Yeah. And then I'd have both. I don't know. I, I, have, to, I have to double check as well. <coughs> I mean, I have that box. Do you want it? For a meaty price? <laughs> did you say meaty? I did. <laughs> like, what kind of meat are we talking here? We're talking like... like we're talking ground beef, like kind of bolognese. Okay. <laughs> a, little so a little thick, you know? I had just pictured like a big pork roast. <laughs> you said meaty. <laughs> <laughs> Our brains went to two different places. Yeah. All right. All right. I, I feel like I need to do some digging and figure out and make my decision because I would like to. And I think it'd be a fun thing to do a video on is, is making your making your team and, and making it uh, unique to you. 
you. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and then it's for a game that I get to play. So I want to do that. Um, the thing that you said that made me nervous because I think it's so important for a game like this to work well is the line of sight stuff. Like to me, like that's the kind of strategy and the kinds of ways that you go about like using skill in, in decision making to, to win. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if to hear that is like confusing and not well defined. <laughs> well, I'm not saying that it's, it's, you can't figure it out. People have figured it out. Okay. And they've even explained it to me. But when I've read the rules, it's just like, I don't know how those conclusions have been drawn. And I definitely am a pedant in that. Like if I don't understand a hundred percent of everything, I'm like just skeptical until mm. I like, until I fully get it. Um, so People have figured it out. Uh, so you just got to talk to the people who actually know what they're you know, doing. Um, I, I don't have them figured out yet. If it makes you feel better, um, I've been playing some edition or another of Dungeons and Dragons for almost 30 years, and I still don't <laughs> understand how the line of sight and, and concealment rules work. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, what, what that says to me is that everyone who thinks they know how line of sight and cover works and kill team doesn't actually know it. They're right. just kind of like confident. No, I'm sure they do. Um, all right, cool. What, uh, what's, what's your preamble ramble, sir? Okay. So last weekend I went to a local, uh, convention, a, uh, Austin con in Austin, Minnesota, home to Hormel. Oh yeah. That's where Hormel, the big Hormel plant is. So the good thing about, or the bad thing, I guess the way you want to look at it is when as soon as you, drive in on highway 14 into austin minnesota the whole city uh smells like spam <laughs> whether that's good or bad that's up to you to decide um that's what the sign says as you drive in yeah <laughs> smells like spam <laughs> smells like spam and i've been to the not this past weekend but I, i've been to the hormel institute before so they have this thing called the institute and it's this big fucking fancy building there mm. and that's where they do a lot of uh, food science is in there okay. for all the products they they make, and they make all sorts of crazy things that um, that I didn't know they made. They make like weird like crackers and stuff, and they make peanut butter. And I know they make peanut butter because one time I was there for work. I was, I'm a member of a board that uh, one of the executives. This was like I don't know seven eight years ago now. Um, of Hormel, one of the executives of Hormel is also on the board, so they hosted a meeting there one time. And after the meeting, this executive goes up to me and goes, you want to see something cool? And I'm like, that's a weird thing to say. But from, from a Hormel exec? Absolutely, yeah. I do. I'm like, yeah, I'm curious. You don't have to ask me twice. Let's see something cool. <laughs> and in this boardroom that we were in, it's all like 1970s wood paneling, like dark oak, everything. It's like my basement, like when I first moved in. Um. But like rich people version. Oh. Like when you go into like, Oh wow, the, that was some shade. <laughs> <laughs> no, I no, yeah. Not like the fake wood paneling that you put on your your cinder block wall. <laughs> but like actual like hard oak. You oh. know, like in like movies like the rich per person's library. Yeah. It yeah. looked like that. Okay. His whole boardroom was. Nice. And so I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And he goes to this we go to what I thought was just a wood paneling, because everything had this filigree and shit around it and he opens a goddamn door and i was like okay this is getting weird did was he like lemon and then the door opened and like now you're descending into the mines of moria is that what's happening right now <laughs> they call it mine. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. um but it was just like a white sterile hallway with like like cfl bulbs oh uh, okay so like now it's a horror movie yeah <laughs> you kind got, of there are bodies back here it's like like look very sterile yeah we're swapping people's brains and other bodies over here so we go from this like warm lush hardwood boardroom to what i assume was a hidden door into this sterile white ass hallway <laughs> and i'm looking over and i'm like what did I agree my head to? <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, this is illicit. Yeah. Either drugs or murder. It's one of the two. Yes. And I was like, can't go back now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, actually, I had a thing. I, I got to get out of here. <laughs> I got I to gotta go. So he takes me and he's like, okay, this is uh, going to go down to a bunch of our testing areas. I'm like, go down? What do you mean go down? He's like, oh, yeah, we've got stuff. I, don't, I probably can't. 
I don't know if I should be saying this, but whatever. <laughs> I don't know if any of this is like high classified information from the Hormel Institute. <laughs> but anyway, so long story short, we walked for quite a while. It felt like something in hindsight out of Stranger Things in those weird like yeah, bunkers they yeah. had. Or like James Bond or some shit. Yeah. But the cool thing was all the shit down there, because it was all sterile because it was all um, food scientists developing and testing food. Right. And um, so after I got that through my head, I was like, oh, maybe this isn't as creepy. It's still kind of creepy, but whatever. But then there's all these like nice people in there with their like hair nets on and their white lab coats. And they're like working on like what well, looks like some, some something out of a science fiction movie. But they're making food stuff. Yeah. Okay? We end up going to a room. <laughs> This story was already good enough. I'm surprised there's more to yeah. it. <laughs> there's more. This is the pinnacle. This is what he really brought me down there. Oh, oh okay, okay. Okay. And he's like, this is, we're going to go um, do some work. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> you mean work? He's like, yeah, we need to do some testing and we need some feedback on something. So he opens up this door, this white door that has a, like a little tiny window in it and goes into a room. And that room was attached to a kitchen, but you couldn't really see the kitchen because the only way you could get to the kitchen was this little like opening in the flat door and there's a bunch of tables and he goes over to the window um, and it was an open window, so there's no glass on it. And he, he like calls for someone to come out and he's like, oh, what are we testing today? And she's like, we're testing um, how we can make the peanut butter less firm while it's in the jar with the jelly for the products that are peanut butter and jelly in the same jar. Okay. So, you know, like goobers and grape? Yeah. So, if you're not from America, you probably don't understand what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> but in America, we've got a lot of stupid food items, and one of them is peanut butter and jelly in the same jar. <laughs> and neither the peanut butter nor the jelly taste quite right. And I learned that day that the reasoning be behind that is the fact that they have to do something to the chemical makeup of both the peanut butter and the jelly so they'll coexist and not just like turn into some nasty fungal sludge. Yeah, like swap fluids and like just be like a, a yes. weird combination of both. Yes. And so I tested... Like seven different kinds of goobers and grape that day. Really? I was put on a cracker and I had to write down all my thoughts uh, on consistency, on flavor, on mouthfeel. God damn. Uh, all these things. This guy was making a huge assumption when he, when he said, do you want to see something cool? One that he would be interested in the first place and like testing seven kinds of like grape jelly. Like what the fuck? I know. <laughs> this is so weird. <laughs> so then I, I left and I was like, as I was leaving that day, I was like, God damn, this was the weirdest work day I think I've ever had. <laughs> yeah, what a what a weird experience. I don't know what else is in the undercarriage of the Hormel <laughs> plant because I just scratched the surface. This sounds like something out of a a, a good a good Batman movie. Yeah, yeah, into. it's just a labyrinth down there. So my story is about the Austin Con convention. <laughs> we did a little we did a little Hormel segue. We though. did a, we did a little sidetrack there, but uh, anyway, it's a gaming convention. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, <laughs> I went. That's where I got sick. My, one of my buddies that went with me got sick, too. So I was like, yeah, we got it from the con. We got the con crud, basically. Con crud. From a small convention. Um, but uh, we played some played some magic. They had some uh, magic drafts events going on there. Played a couple different games. Checked out the silent auction. And they had a painting competition. Nice. And I entered the painting competition. I entered my dragon um, from Creature Caster, and I entered my um, why can I, am I blanking on his name? The Primark that I did for the oh Games Conrad Workshop. Cruz Conrad Conrad Cruz. Um, <laughs> Are you sharking local competitions right now? Did you blow it out of the water? Yeah, <laughs> I got best in show with the dragon, nice. and then I got. Okay, here's the thing. So my buddy Michael, who listens to the podcast, he is a goody peepee. He runs Austin Con, and it's all for charity. Like everything that they that they do for Austin Con, any any money at all that they make, that he and his wife spend so many hours over the course of the year to pull this thing together. Every dime they make goes to charity. So I 
you know, I, I appreciate all of his hard work. And one of the things he does is he works with a, a local like trophy maker for the for the plaques mm-hmm. for the painting competition. And they're so fucking nice. So I'm like, well, if I'm gonna go to Osakon anyway, I kind of want one of those trophies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, when I got home, this was Monday. Um, I went Saturday and then I went back Sunday to pick up my pieces and and, and everything. Uh, and I had my dragon and Conrad in my travel case stuck down with poster tack on Monday. I took the dragon out and I like, he like dislodged a little bit to pop it out of the, the poster tack. Scary. And as it did that, it clean broke the dragon clean broke and fell onto my dog, <laughs> which broke then off a of what broke off the base. Yeah, so the dragon is basically th- four parts. There's the rock that it's on, and then there's connection point of one claw is on the peak of the rock, and then this a, I think it's its tail wraps around the rock, um, and there's like little indents coming out where the the rock fits in with the little tongue and groove thing, and then the two wings are separate pieces. <clears throat> I must have used like not a great super glue to glue it together because it was clean break it snapped and the pieces just basically fell apart (laughs) okay oddly enough so then i used the gorilla glue gel when i re put it back together and that shit ain't going anywhere now did you like have like a moment of panic i thought it snapped the fucking thing off and i was like god and then i picked it out and i was like looked at it i'm like i'm good there's a couple of parts where i'm gonna have to repaint it but yeah um I think I posted a picture of that on Instagram too, of the broken dragon sitting on my desk with the tr- with the little plaque. Oh no! Uh, I was like, oh, it, would have, it could have been so much worse. Yeah. All right. Before we get to what we painted, we have a little bit of exciting reveals that Scott showed to me. Instead of getting my like live excited reaction here on the on the podcast, but you guys can have your own reaction. Scott, what do we have? We got a couple new sound effects for our sound pad bank here. The first one being, here's why you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Such an essential statement. Yeah. That one's going to get so much use. Yes. The good old Vinci V, here's why you're wrong. Yes. And the thing is, is that clip, we asked him to say that line and it's still delivered in the most organic, nonchalant, Vincey V way. <laughs> it's as if he said that line seven million times before in his life because he has. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> All right, what's our next one? Number two. Sure. Oh, uh, another classic Vincey V-ism. Sure, it's, sure. It's it's so much accento escrito on the shh. Yeah. Just, just sure. You might be able to use these in combo. Sure. Here's why you're wrong. I mean, yeah. it feels like he's right here, I you know? know? It's almost as if Ghost of Vinci V is here beside us. Yes. Okay, and the last one, a John request. Oh, baby. We've been spotting. The red exclamation point just <laughs> popped above my head. Yes. Okay, so now, so we're going to be able to, we're going to have to learn to navigate the pages because there's pages here. Yes. Um, uh-oh. 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 Uh oh. We, we don't have access to the pages. It should be a or button. Dead air. I know. There, there was arrows there before. The arrows are gone. Maybe you can't move it while it's recording. That would seem, oh, that would seem very silly. But that sounds accurate. Okay. Well, we'll figure that out later. On to what we painted. What did we paint? We're going to start with you because you painted way more than me. <laughs> <laughs> I did some more work on Halgrim. I painted his TMM fully, so that's all done. Uh, I had three kinds of TMM on there. I had obviously the silver. I had the gold. And then I did kind of like a rusty uh, TMM to his like scale mail and his like weapon blade, which didn't really... It's kind of like pointing downwards, so you can't really see it, so I didn't really try that hard. But... um. I, th- I know that it's kind of weird to have like rusty metal with shiny metal, but uh, honestly, I just wanted to make the scale mail rusty so that it would just look different than the other ones without being like too visually distinctive. Um, and that was what I came up with. Um, started working on the bone. The bone's kind of like this fun blue greenish kind of off white color. Um, got the cape left and the hair. I think that I'm done. Bro, how did you do this? Like, Remember, did you ever, as a as a kid, did you ever play the game Operation? Yes. You know I'm talking about? Yes. Bro, the, the f- tibia, femur. The femur on this dude's right leg 
to paint that. That's like some operation game. Wait, I don't know what the femur is. It's the big bone on the thigh. Oh, you in like, there, dude? Yeah, you like dude. Get in there like you're playing operation with yeah, the little tweezers. Yeah, yeah, I got in there, dude. Get some long bristle brushes, a little sharp tip, stick it in there. Yeah, that wasn't I, fun. I like the blue, desaturated blue base color for bone. Thank you. Yeah, I, I like it too. I think there's a lesson in that. What's that? In that, if there's a thing that you want to be a color, like I want bones are basically white, give or take, cream, off, whatever. Whatever you start with adds interest. It doesn't define what the final color will be. 100%. And that's just, that's a great example of it, that that reads as bone to me, but it's interesting and different. Yeah without having to know all this crazy complexity and artsy fartsy stuff to res to re you know get that result so yeah if you got like a as like a hack say you have like a paint scheme you have a spot color in that paint scheme um you're like whites can be like that color can be added in a muted way to the shadows of your whites so i have a spot color in my scheme well, it's not really a spot color but i have blue as part of my scheme across my entire <laughs> soul black gravelord army um and so i just included that in my white uh, you can do the same with black you can like highlight black with a lot of bizarre colors um and make it look pretty interesting um the hard part with white though is that very often if you're not careful that color that you pick can sometimes dominate and define the color um for instance i did that video where i was trying to paint white and everyone said that at the end of it, it looked like pink because I left too much of that warm color around in the midtone and stuff like that. So it's kind of a game of chicken a little bit. Like how crazy of a color do you want to go and how much white do you want to have? Uh, you need to like strike a good balance. Um, painted that one. And then I went to a cabin this last weekend and I was playing kill team with my friend Scott, um, who I think listens to the podcast. And uh, he is a stickler for painting all the stuff he plays with. So terrain, all the armies. And I wanted to respect that desire of his. So I wanted to walk up with a fully painted kill team. But <clears throat> instead of just repainting or finishing the two kill teams that I have almost done, I have the Kamarite, which is basically the Dark Eldar mm -hmm. team, and the Ecclesiarchy, which is essentially just the Sister of Battle team. Instead of just finishing those, which I had already started, I wanted to paint a full squad because that would make for a more compelling video. Um, as you understand, you know, it's not a lot of free time to paint miniatures. If you're going to paint something, it's going to go into the video, most likely. Yeah. Um, so I was making a video. And uh, the video is all about making speed painting work for me. Um, and you'll hear more about that in the video itself or in the extended version of this podcast and the things that I learned this last week. And if you didn't know, uh, patrons of this podcast get access to a 20 to 30 minute longer episode. And one of those segments is John and I talking about things we learn in the hobby. So that'll come later if you are a Patreon member. Um, but I, f I fucking did it. I gave myself a dumb YouTube challenge that involved painting some amount of models and I fucking finished it for once in my goddamn life. Um, I feel like I have so many of these dumb things where I just, I just suck and I don't finish them. Like uh, we had that challenge together where we wanted to paint a fantasy army in two days and you finished yours and I didn't finish mine. And then we had another collab plan where uh, the, the original video intent was like, how long does it take to paint an army that you care about? Mm -hmm. um, but then it kind of like changed because obviously you have a different release schedule than me at the time and you finished your army and I didn't finish my army. And I'm just like, I just keep failing. And so I just needed a W. And so while I was at that cabin, I fucking bought, busted my ass. I was like, I was painting while people were sleeping, while they were watching movies, while they were kind of, you know, sitting down and just chilling. And I finished this dumbass squad and I'm so happy that I have a, th a thing that's done. Um, you probably have the same feeling as me. I would. I love this idea of having a painted squad for every game that I yeah. might conceivably play. Yeah, which is a ridiculous like hope. But so far, I have this for Kill Team. I have a fully painted team for Guild Ball, and I have like a a five hundred point team. Sorry, army for Age of Sigmar painted. Um, so I'm getting there. Oh, actually, I have a bigger one because I have a Wood Elf one that's fully painted too, um, and that's more like fifteen hundred points. You 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 spent time in like in in small important areas. That one also is one that I spent much longer on. I can tell in the face. The face looks amazing. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um. So that one was a four to five hour paint job. The rest of these hovered in the forty five minute to one hour range. Um. 
and kind of breaking the speed painting down in that way is what I want to talk about in the in the extended portion. I, I used the uh, paper plant products from uh, Gamer Grass just to try it out. Like, yeah, I think when you think of stuff like that, it feels gimmicky, like a, a piece of paper that has a printed design on it, and you can see the white edges a little bit. I didn't I didn't paint them at all. I just I just stuck them on. Um, I think it adds something though. Too. You know, it, yeah, it adds something. It's fine. Um, yeah. I wouldn't put it on a display piece. If I did, I would definitely paint it, like in like make it meld more. Um, but for a gaming thing, it just adds a little bit of spice. Yeah, it it, it catches my eye a little bit more too. Yeah, so, yeah, very cool. I Thank think you. these look these ladies look great. Thank you. And I got to play a game of uh, Kill Team at the cabin against uh, my buddies. Uh, oh, his clowns, Harlequins. That's what they're called. See, so yeah, I thought I painted. Okay. I didn't actually paint anything now that I think about that. I just I <laughs> thought about this on the way up here. I was like, God damn it, I haven't painted anything since the last podcast. And the reason why is um, this week I have been testing putting the new Games Workshop tools through their paces for a video that as of the as of this video, this podcast episode going live should have been out for a day or two now. So you can go check that out. Prior to that, I spent an, an asinine amount of time building up a diorama of the Soulblight Gravelord's box cover artwork. Mm. And so that was a lot of hobbying, um, but there was no, technically, there was no paint on model. Yeah. I mean, that, that <clears throat> absolutely counts. And if you guys don't know what that box art is, it's the... Uh, female slash male vampire standing with a bit of a moonlight rim light to her with a big uh, shiny red armor castle in the background skeletons wolves in the foreground it's a sick piece of art uh, I have it hanging here in the office and yeah it's on all the the battle tomes for soul black grave lords and throughout that process um, it's very difficult I I've, I've never gone to like we're, we're gonna talk about this in the after party with the patrons about the something new or, or something what else I've, that I've, I've tried. It, there was a lot of like really aha moments and really frustrating moments in that process that sometimes was even hard to communicate in the video um, to, but to like have to create something from nothing. You'd think having a bit of artwork would help you because <laughs> you just like, I want it to look like this. Yeah. Um, but you realize it doesn't work that way. It makes it harder, right? Yeah. It makes it harder. And it, it like, I actually, I, I give, you know, speaking of sure, our buddy Vincey V, um, <laughs> I, I, I thank him a lot because I asked him so many questions. There's, um, and I sent him a lot of pictures and I said, this is what I'm frustrated with. This is what I'm dealing with. And he gave me a lot of good feedback and he gave me a lot of options. And he's like, he kept helping me out with things. Um, I think he's got a lot of experience in what ends up looking good. And so definitely, um, it was a fun experience and I'm not done. I, I need to not let that start collecting dust. I need to get that 100% built. So one, um, a lot of people wanted to see that what the next steps are, like what, what's important next. Um, and so if I'm going to get this thing done, um, I need to not let it sit for more than like a week or two mm -hmm. at a time. Yeah. If it's in some, in my free time, um, I need to, I need to keep it a priority in my life. Yeah, that's true. I have so many work in progress paint jobs cause it's just so easy to let something just you like just pause a paint job and then move on to something else and totally forget about it. So yeah, I definitely get that, but it is pretty cool. I can't wait to see it fully painted. I'm sure it'll be done by next Adepticon. Fully confident, not joking. I mean, there's so many goddamn models on there. Well, I mean, and I feel like I need more models on there. Like, yeah. Oh, sweet. I got to paint 15 or more models. <laughs> Fuck yeah. me. And I, I mean, I want to say that, <laughs> It's done when it's done, right? Like if you're yeah. if you're putting in the time and being consistent and painting it, if it doesn't get done by March, that's okay. Yeah. Just keep working on it. When it's done, it's done and you'll get that a better chance at whatever you're trying to do when it's Slayer Sword placed in a category. Yeah. Whatever it is, you know? Like just don't rush perfection, you know? Yeah. And that's uh 
that that's a little bit of a, a tie-in to something I wanted to discuss on today's main topic. Cause yeah. I think that there's some value in that. Oh, absolutely. Some things that we've learned from golden demon this year. Yep. This is it. This is my, like, this is my shot. I'm taking a shot. If it's done this year, like I'm, I'm trying to tell myself it's done this year, but like, this is my full ball sack okay. for a demon. So okay. I need to, I, uh, I, I, there's no excuses and maybe I'll, maybe, it, maybe this isn't my one shot, but this might be a very big learning experience for me too, because I've never done a big piece like this before. This portion of today's episode is sponsored by Cobalt Keep, a miniature accessory brand that focuses around the usage of magnets. Cobalt Keep sells a variety of base sizes that you might find in your typical games, but what's special about these bases is the magnet well on the underside, which allows for easy installation with a little super glue. New to the line is the 28 and a half millimeter diameter base for all those sisters of battle players out there. I use Cobalt Keep bases whenever I visit Scott to do the podcast, storing the couple of minis that I've painted in one of their stackable display cases for miniatures. The cases come in a variety of sizes and are designed to be stacked on top of each other. I'm using Cobalt Keep bases on my Soulblight Gravelord army for Age of Sigmar and my Greyjoy army for Song of Ice and Fire. Now your mirrors are able to stick to any metal surface such as a stackable display case or the cobalt keep painting hilt that comes in two different sizes, one a little larger than the other for different sized hands. The smaller of the two handles has a convenient base to stabilize the model on your desk while you're not painting it. They also have an accessory kit that you can use with the painting hilt if you're painting models and sub-assemblies and still want to use your magnetic solutions. Just pin a head, arm, or whatever bit to the piece of cork and pop it on your painting handle. Cobalt Keep has been such an amazing brand for like me to work with and also John to work with. And also, I, mean, I think the biggest like indicator that they make quality stuff is that we personally use it like in our in our daily hobby. Uh, so thanks to Cobalt Keep for sponsoring this portion of today's episode. If you want to check them out, you can find it linked down in the show notes and description below. Now on to the main topic. In this episode, we're going to talk about our favorite entries from the most recent Golden Demon event over at the UK. As well as some interesting tidbits and things that went on over there that might be an indication of the future of Golden Demon. Ooh. I think at the facility of Warhammer World is where they had yeah. the, uh, the event. Yes, it was. Um, now, this one was a, a unique one in that, was it split across multiple weekends? So like you had like the painting thing on one weekend and then a different, week, a th a different weekend had something else, right? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Because like normally like Warhammer World or Games Day or whatever their other previous iterations of cons happened, it was everything put together. It was gaming stuff. It was painting stuff. It was Golden Demon. And I think this event that we saw was exclusively a Golden Demon thing. It was just painting stuff, right? Yeah, I think it was that. And maybe it was like a celebration, a 30th or 35th or something celebration yeah. or something too. I think you're right about that too. Um but you're right, it, it wasn't like a gaming tournament thing or whatever. Um, and from the sounds of it, um, with the issues with the tickets and everything, it sounds like pretty much everybody that wanted to go to compete was able to. Um, but whether by getting their own tickets or a large percentage of people having to like ask friends or, or find <laughs> some on the secondary market. You think that people like outside uh Warhammer world, just scalping tickets for golden demon, you know, like if at bas basketball games or you walk across up. the street. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I got tickets. I got two, I got two 50 bucks. That's right. Yeah. You can go down and get Timberwolves tickets at any time. Yeah, anytime. Like yeah. Bucks they're, in all, Minnesota. they're always there. Yeah. yeah. Across the street. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like once they were there, like people that were there, like that it was it was fine. Like it was a good size event. The the amount of people that I saw from the pictures, um, it looks like it was a pretty busy event. Like the the line to like slowly walk through the cases and look at all the the uh, miniatures was massive. Yeah, dude. Um, I mean, you always get that feeling of FOMO, right? You see all those people. Yeah. You see, like, the the ones that really get me are the after-party pictures. You yeah. know, it's like, I saw a picture of people, like, uh, um, hanging out at someone's house, and, and it was a bunch of amazing painters, and they all brought their display models, and they were just sitting on top of a stovetop, like an, an electronic stovetop. And it was just like, bro, one person sits on that thing 
like one of those dials the wrong way, you fucking Oof. end people's lives or at yeah. least hundreds of hours of their time. Mm. Uh, so that was a little spooky. But like I always see those photos. I'm like, damn, I wish I was there. And furthermore, if I was there, I wish I was invited. <laughs> mm. um, but yeah, that, that's what always gets me. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it was. Um, there's a ton of I mean, not only was there a ton of people there to look at models, but from my understanding and from the pictures that we've seen the sheer volume of incredibly painted models there um is blows away anything that any golden demon dare say maybe any painting event we've seen yeah and I'm a I, little I'm a little cynical about that because I feel like you always hear that comment whenever you go to any painting competition. Yeah. Like, oh, the competition was so rough. Or sorry, it was so good. There were so many entries. It was so like the, the skill level just keeps raising. And it's like, yeah, maybe that's true. Maybe maybe it's true for this one, but I kind of feel like I kinda always hear that, don't yeah, you? Yeah, you're you're right. That is that is absolutely the case. And because we weren't there, I you, you can't I like, can't really know. Can't really know. I mean, there's no, there is no doubt that the people that were are su- submitting miles there are incredible, and what they submitted were were incredible, as you'll hear when we just shower them with praise in this next segment. Yeah. But whether or not it's like the best one, it's hard. It's hard for me to say. But yeah, I mean, anyone else can make that claim, right? And and like knowing the quality of painters and the quality of paint jobs that did not place. Um, yeah, I know. Scary. Yeah. How how impressive that would be but again i don't know um exactly we didn't go i don't know how many americans went hmm i don't even i don't know if any of them play i mean i don't know all the painters that play some of them sound like they could be americans but obviously that doesn't mean anything um yeah i have no idea i don't yeah i'm i'm guessing some americans went but if vincey v doesn't go who the fuck's going right <laughs> uh, like vincey v is like thirsty bro yeah he's he is like the uh, he's on the he is the masthead on the santa maria that's going <laughs> <laughs> from america to the other way <laughs> going back the other way <laughs> right and so i think part of that was because we had a golden demon here first yeah possibly so let let the record show <laughs> <laughs> so also here's what i'll say that Another reason why this could be considered one of the greater Golden Demons of the, of the last however many years is because this is the first Golden Demon event in the UK, I think, since they've all been canceled due to COVID, right? Yes. So the, the first one was the one in the US, but the first one in the UK, the, the home and heart of Games Workshop, the company, um, just happened. So maybe a lot of people have been saving up their entries uh, to a con that they can travel to, and this is, this is represented. Yeah. Um, but... Should we get on with it? Yeah. I'll, um, I have things that aren't specifically with the models that I want to talk about, but we let's can do, do that at the end. Oh, what, whenever is whenever you see fit. Okay. Um, yeah, let's do it at the end. <laughs> okay. So All right. We're starting out in single miniature, specifically for the 40K. Uh, There's a lot of... A lot of <laughs> I, 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 I'm concerned for the length of this episode. Yeah. I don't, I don't that. think we're going to get nitty gritty in, in every piece or whatever, but we might, we might have like one thing of interest in each category yeah um for, so. i mean single uh, so the single fantasy sorry single 40k gold place maxine Pinaud, previous slayer sword winner who had the troll entry this is a totally custom sculpt that somehow is not an open yes it is completely 100 percent sculpted by him there's pictures of it on instagram of him co- totally sculpted it. why is it not an open because i did a little digging on this and asked as well um, because at first I thought it was, I thought the reason why, and what we're going to try to do as well in this episode is one for you watching on YouTube, we hopefully we'll get pictures of these to be able to put on the screen, but two, maybe f- focus our discussion or try to paint pictures with our words um, away from like, just like, oh, look at this thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We'll, um, we'll be, we'll be visually descriptive for sure. But um, so, so it is a, a Nurgle infected orc. Mm-hmm. And that is the sculpt, and he has sculpted it from scratch. And it sounds like he sculpted it like years ago. Like, yes, yes, like five somewhere between five and ten years. Yeah, ago. that's what I heard too, or that's what rather what I read on Instagram. <clears throat> so, under the rules for Golden Demon, it says you can sculpt something. You can't use 
models from other game companies, but it needs to be to scale and it needs to be within the Warhammer universe. So it needs to very much feel like Games Workshop. Okay. Check, check, check. And that's it. And, and this is really interesting because it's really hard to tell the scale of this orc. This is smaller than a Primaris Marine. Wow. Because I saw uh, it side by side with one. And it doesn't look like that to me. This looks like it's big, like the size of a ogre or, a, or, or bigger than that even. But it's, you know, you can't really tell. There's no frame of reference. Right, you can't. So, okay, I still have a question about why it's not an open. I thought open was if a model is fully sculpted, full stop, it goes in open. No, all those ones like Eric Swinson's one or whatever, those aren't to scale. That's why they oh, have to be open. Oh, so it needs to be to scale. It needs okay. to be a 32 millimeter scale. All right. So if this orc was big, like that Mephiston or Andy Wardle's... Um, Teclas. Teclas then yes, it would have to be an open. If that tech list... Speaking of entries that didn't get uh, an award, so if that's laying off to the side, what the fuck else is yeah, out that's, there? That's exactly it. Yeah. Um, and so if tech list or that Mephiston were to scale, 32 millimeter scale, and I mean, technically that Mephiston wouldn't have to have been a whole lot smaller because... Apparently, Primarchs are like 17 feet tall as humans. So um, <laughs> um, then it would have been able to go into 40K single. Okay. Interesting. I had to do some digging on that because I thought this doesn't fucking make any sense to me. Yeah. Um, this sculpting. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of par for the course. If you could critique Golden Demon on anything, it's just transparency. It's like you don't really know what they're looking for. And honestly... The, the few times I went to ask for feedback, it doesn't really help. Um, partially because there's just so much shit that they have to judge. And they don't write any of it down, so they don't know like your specific entry. But uh, Speaking yeah. of feedback, the uh, painters did not get feedback that from judges on this. Feels but, bad. Um, yeah, because the judges were not um, publicly announced. So you don't know who judged this. And because you don't know... And you couldn't talk to the judges and ask them questions. Okay. Bring your pieces. Like we could at Adepticon. We could do that. And I did that. I did that and too. It, yeah. And it was helpful, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> Other than the fact that poor Aiden had like 500 people waiting in line to talk to him. Right, yeah. I'll be honest. My feedback was not helpful. He told me that I did something wrong that I did intentionally. So I just felt like, okay, well, maybe that is helpful. Maybe, maybe my idea just didn't translate as intentional enough. So yeah, there you go. It was helpful. Um, okay. Uh, the other two entries in single 40K here, I think we have to talk about one of them. Albert Moreto Font. Um, this guy just got, he's got a style, bro. As soon as you see the model, you fucking know it's his. Um, my God. it. So this is a converted goblin uh, single entry. The I love the head of the, the goblin he uses like a pewter. Yeah, Peter model. Uh, he's sitting on a rock, outcropping a little squig, some cactus. He's holding like a staff with uh, some goblin moons on it. Lovely, lovely anime work. That smoke is so great. That dark charcoal smoke. The pink knees, the pink nose, the pink lips, the palms. Um, man, he's just he's just jam packing so much beautiful color in here and so much smoothness. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, he's. Uh He's the, what, one, two models a year guy. Yes, yes. Which um, is what we're going to get to later on, and we, we, we culminate this. I have I have some hot takes on this, that um, gone are the days of 150 hours being enough to win. Oh, I don't know about that. But I, 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 I do know about that. I'm looking forward to talking about that. Okay. Uh, the other entry, beautiful painted Eldar. All of these models are fucking beautiful. Like yes. the, it's it's hard to 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 find critiques. Um, the squad pictures are a little bit hard to see what's going on, so I don't know how to comment the best on these. Yeah, I feel um, like they can't take great squad pictures for some reason. It's just because they're far. You know, they're far away. They're spread out and stuff. There's like more that. depth of field that that they need to hit. Yeah, yeah. So more like, more of the money's being focused. I got to zoom it out more. Like I'm sure this squad would got bronze of Poxwalkers is awesome looking but i cannot tell i could not tell that from the picture like the picture i'm like i don't know yeah yeah but i'm i 
fully believe that they're painted really well yeah <coughs> they, the, they the all picture look, does not show me that they do not yeah i love how the the like the road texture is part of the base so you can just put them in their little diorama uh, spot and they kind of match yep. uh, so if you're cool with it maybe we just skip over the squad ones because we yeah we can't really see them very well yeah they look fine but, but congratulations to those of you absolutely now vehicle baby <sighs> okay david soper recreating his 1992 two or 93 Sloy slayers are winning nurgle tank in a modern form little campy painted delectably um got gold in the vehicle category another paints two models a year gentleman here in david soper yeah um, but when you you don't need to paint more than two when you can paint like this my god yeah. <laughs> this, this man paints to a, a different level in the, the pictures um like I, what I'd recommend to really get a full feel of how well David paints is to go check out his Instagram and oh look at his, his like whips of like little individual things he's doing. Like, like this little section of the arm or like this little bit where like he's got this like gross exposed hand and it's robotic pieces underneath it and like the slime and the bubbles and like no, no small detail was not given the utmost attention. Yeah, so, and that is 100 percent true, and you can you can even see more detail on his blog site, which is called Sprockets Small World. Blogspot. Com, I believe. Um, the this has been a ongoing process for at least two, if not more, years. Yeah, um, and it's incredible. It's years. An, it's an incredible uh, like testament. The the second one I want to mention here is Stephen Smith. You know who Stephen Smith is. Yeah, isn't he a friend of uh, somebody? Mid he's affiliated with uh, with Guy from Midwinter Minis. He's like his uh, his night dude. He uh, strolled up with a couple of vehicle related entries and also uh, I believe a single figure in in, in 40k um, and got and netted a silver uh, for his lovely painted. Uh, I don't know what uh, what faction this is. I'm sorry, I'm not much of a Space Marine boy. Uh, it's it's some kind of a knight. It's the it's the teal faction. So is it, it's the one that's like, <coughs> well, it's not like uh, Emperor's Children, right? No, but it's, it's the one where it's like, oh, fuck, I can't remember the name of it. It doesn't matter. I lost interest. Yeah, I know. It's 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 not worth our time. Yes, this orc bike looks friggin' lovely. Uh, love the sign and the rusty little thing. This is uh, the third place. Um, it's a it's a two orcs on a like a like a trike a big old trike with a lovely little sign little desert base um i like the thing about the orc tricycle that i like the most is the little driver guy he's wearing a bandana over his face you know like when you're out in your dune buggy and you got to keep all the the sand out of your face yeah 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 and uh, the person painted like freehanded on that bandana over the face like a like a skull like a punisher yeah skull yeah. on the bandana and i'm like that's freaking cool yeah it's a nice little detail that i think it looks really really cool yeah that is awesome okay the sign on the base says dabunka and the other one says gomi gomi settlement that's got crossed out and oh i think this is humi settlement and they got crossed out and says umi umi Oh, a human, and then it says free loot instead, so <laughs> they can go and just raid and pillage the human uh, settlement for stuff. Love that. That's so cool. Yeah, it's it's very uh, very atmospheric, and that's something I've seen um, throughout a lot of these, um, a lot of the pieces. Is that they always say with Golden Demon that your basing is not going to like make or break your piece. Well, where it can help is if it if it helps to tell your story um as opposed to like if you have this i actually think a, a great example of this of you can have an amazing base but if you take the model off the base and the model on its own <coughs> isn't also painted to the nines that base is not going to elevate your standing however if it, it can help you tell your story better, it can be maybe a, a tiebreaker. Yeah, thing. absolutely. I think a great example of this from this year's was Mike McVeigh's piece, mm. which was... Speaking of legends, bro. Yeah. Also, 
didn't place? No, it did not place. Damn. Um, so he did that ogre from Curse City and did a head swap to an orc. Such a great idea. You know, and he like the shoulder has almost like a bad moon goblin thing on yeah. it. So it worked so well. Yeah. The base that he sculpted, first of all, like it felt so Mike McVeigh. Like it's so weird that it's like, oh yeah, that like I can tell who did that. It's wild. It is so beautifully done and so crisply painted. Um, but I think because the execution on the model wasn't quite up to what other people's were, the amazing base didn't actually um, bring him over the top. But I will say, like, he had probably one of my favorite basing setups of the entire Golden Demon that I saw pictures of. Like, it's so, it's so cool. And it's so Warhammer. It felt so Warhammer fantasy, um, which maybe that, that's not what they're looking for anymore. But it felt that, like, in a very nostalgic, really cool way. It did. Like, the whole, like, city streets vibe yes. of, of, like, a, an, <coughs> an empire city or something like that. It was, it was really cool. Um, all right, on the large for 40k here. Um, again, because these are bigger and they're on larger bases, the photos are taken from further away, so they're a little bit harder to zoom in on. But I'm loving this gold entry here. Uh, I don't get the pox walker head swap. It feels I, I don't like that, but that's just my personal opinion, man. Man, the, like the armor job, the 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 rust. It's both clean and purposeful the the waves of the sand like there's a lot to love about this oh place. man the waves of the sand is fantastic i think the i think the head just gives it a a mad max like kind of more fun loving vibe um it is a smidge small it feels yes. like for the body very small um but uh i love the goggles i think the goggles really work for like kind of the environment that we're oh, yeah, in the you're sandiness right. you're right I, um, i'm with you there yeah i love it i love the uh you have the orange of the rust, uh, like the teal elements, like the the teal trim, the teal or like the blue banner. Those really work together to contrast nicely. Um, it's a it's a lovely paint job from who is this? Alonso Garcia Tovar. I've never heard of him. Yes. Um, got any other uh, thoughts on the other large entries? I mean, both of them. They didn't. I didn't immediately know what the models were. Yeah, actually, I'm right there with you. Neither of them I know exactly what they are. Um. Yeah, we're just gonna leave it at that because I don't a hundred percent know what either of those are. Like the 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 anyway, the silver one, it does look familiar. Like it's from a recent, uh, like a chaos demony thing. Yeah, like a spawn or something like that. Um, yes, I, I gotta think that that silver one is or that bronze one is is some kind of a kit bash or custom sculpt or some, because that doesn't look familiar at all. Mm. Either way, um, okay. On to the most important category. Warhammer Age of Sigmar single miniature. Absolutely, bro. Can we talk about this off-balance uh, vampire horse here for a second? Okay. So this bronze one is it's beautiful because it's a goddamn vampire in red armor. Uh, that yeah. fucking shiny-ass red armor, that free hand, bro. <laughs> I love the pose of the blade. Like, he is coming down on something. Yeah, the, the pose of him swinging down. It's like, it's like he's, he's like, like letting like momentum kind of take over, and he's just going to fucking crush something. I love that. It is a beautifully painted vampire riding a horse, and the horse is, like, flying down a tree limb. Like, it hit, the horse can fly, too. I don't know. That's what the picture is telling me. But this the angle in this this horse coming down in these little tiny little branches feels weird to me. Painted amazingly, composition wise, don't like it. Yeah, it's my opinion. I feel like if a guy if a heavily armored dude on like a heavy a heavy horse were flying through the air, I think maybe just the posing would be a little bit different. Maybe the energy would be a little bit different. Um, but you know, even if you used the thing that it's coming down on the connection point, which is obviously to this looks like um, roots from something you got off of the ground, out of the ground. Mm, I, don't, I don't know if it's connected to a root. I think it's probably connected to a piece of like, I know, but that, that thing is obviously roots. Oh, like yes. The, the thing that he used to make this tree or, or shrubbery or whatever is yeah. roots. If it felt a little bit more like a either a sculpted or three D printed or something something that felt a little bit more Warhammer universe to me, I I think and that was what he was connected to, I think my brain would like that more. Interesting, okay, because it just feels so 
I don't know. So so flimsy, I guess is the word. It does feel a little flimsy. I think he's trying to imply something about like the weight of the creature and that it is able to fly and stuff yes. like that. Yes. Um, sure. But yeah, wonderfully painted. All right, back to number one. Another Albert Moreto font goblin. This 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 one's old. Like he's painted yeah. this year. He painted this years ago. I've seen this one before. I think yes. probably at Monte San Savino, <coughs> um, and other places like World Model Expo and stuff like that. Um, I mean, not to like sound like it's not impressive, but it's more the same thing he did earlier in the fantasy. It's just I know no one who can produce a result that looks like this so soft there's something about it it's like it's like so it's like you used a a softened filter on photoshop or something kind of yeah like Um, and i don't mean that in a negative way i mean that in a very positive way it's like there is there's no such thing as a non-blended surface (laughs) i know it's but it's almost something even more than that because i feel like we say this all the time where something is like incredibly smooth but this is just a different an animal I, I i don't it's like i think a lot of it is that there's like a lot of micro texture going on that's so inconceivably small like on the bag for instance like even yeah. the bag looks you know he kind of highlights the bag a little bit like it is a little silky i think i think that's kind of maybe his trick is that a lot of his stuff he paints as if it's slightly reflective like the moon and the bag and and the piece of metal at the bottom of the spear and the fingernails and even the skin is painted to look a little reflective um so in, okay so to to dissect that so if you're gonna say that you're you're gonna paint things i think um even like the bone on the staff the bone that's connected to the bag even that even that yeah it's what he's doing is he's he's not so much pushing it from the dark side like he's not pushing the darks darker like a a, a bit of metal would be but he's pushing the highlights to be more reflective on the brighter side to create um to create more interest and more separation of things of surfaces yeah i also think it has to do with where he puts his highlights like if we look at the pink sack for a bit it's like got, it's got bounce reflections it's got bounce reflections and also like there's this like long running teardrop highlight down like the creases of the bag and like the the recessed areas are dark yet they're on top of the bag so it it feels a little reflective same with the moon like if you look at the moon and the very top edge of the moon, you see a dark line. And then as it rotates toward the camera, it gets brighter. And as it rotates away, it gets darker. And then there's a blue yeah. rim light around the edge. So you, that that's more obvious. That is metal. But the bone is an interesting observation because like that has a bounce light too. It's like white, dark line, white highlight at the bottom. Um, right? So it's like mm. everything is a little bit... It's, it's, on, it's on the scale of <laughs> reflectivity. Um and then also, it's soft as fuck. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, um, it's silky. Also, let me let me just. This happened multiple times actually on the uh, the entrance. Is it okay to paint the flat of an entire weapon black and just call it good? Because not only on this one, but also on second place, the entire flat of the weapon is painted in black. Yeah. And it's just like but you, really, as long as you have those little glinty things that overtake it that touch it then it's fine this feels like a warhammerism this feels like a no this feels like a golden demon hall pass right here it's like this is a thing that we don't care about and is accepted as good but to me it's like that flat is an opportunity for artistry and for showing off even more skill so why just paint it black you're right the x of the second place yeah the exact same thing exact same thing yeah but it also has that little glint yeah a little, little know, glint overhang baby thing, you know it's a thing uh for for audio listeners so what we're talking about is um if there is a flat surface on a on a blade so you know if a blade isn't shaped like a triangle you look at it from the side if it's if it's got a flat between the two blades or the flat of an of an axe they're painting it pure black just pure black but then the edge where that where that black surface meets the actual edge of the blade, there's a there's a highlight there where those lines meet, and then they have a little cling, a glint, and that glint of light is the only thing that permeates the darkness the, of the black. Yeah, it just sneaks in like one percent, two percent of the way. It sneaks over, so that's how you they're like ah, that's how you know I did this. I thought on about it, you know, I painted it. I painted it. 
It's like, okay, it doesn't look bad. It doesn't look bad, but I feel like it could look cooler if someone of this talent decided to like paint that thing as an actual metallic surface. <clears throat> I mean, you certainly want to, it's, it creates the most drama if where that flat meets the angled edge of the blade where it's a really light surface where that, where that blade edge is and the very dark surface of the flat meet. But when you go away from that dramatic point mm -hmm. into the, the, the belly of that flat area, you can start making it lighter again. Yeah, you can start doing fun things, adding shapes and stuff like that, making them smaller, bigger, brighter, darker. It, just, it can just be a ton of like micro textures and scratches and stuff on that flat too yeah. that I think looks looks really cool. So anyway, that's a thing. It's really weird. The first and second both had it in this category. Yeah. I really love the second place thing. The thing <laughs> yeah. that I love the most about that is that goddamn base. Really? Oh, you you keep going on about these tiny little mossy tufts. I want them you? little mossy tufts, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Give me them. Give me them little tufts. They got the little tiny, tiny tufts of different colors. How sad do you think Sten Froden would be if you said the favorite thing about his entry was the fucking bass? It is. Which does look fantastic, but that NMM, bro. Whoo! God damn! It looks great. I it, love it. This is, uh, to me, this is uh, this barbarian that got silver. It falls into skink category. So skink from Golden Demon, Adepticon, which one's Slayer Sword. Just painted elegantly, simply to perfection. Mm. He painted this barbarian so, so well. So here's why you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think skink slides more on the scale toward heavy metal expectations. And this kind of slides a little bit back toward um, something more like you would see from... Uh, uh, maybe a French or an Italian or a Spanish painter. Like there's a little bit more kind of out of the box painting. It is, they, they share elements a hundred percent, but I think they may be a, a little bit different. Um, both very clean executions though. So remind me, did the skink use NMM? I can't actually remember. I think it did. Nope. Okay. No, it was TMM. Okay. So this maybe I, I see TMM. I, I love golden demon because they kind of don't give a fuck about, TMM like that's another thing it's like if it exists it's good enough if NMM exists and it ain't selling that effect hard you're fucked mm. um, so like there's this I think you'll, you'll, you'll catch eyes with NMM with a, a good paint job but if, if you don't do well you'll do really badly but with TMM you can kind of just paint it a warm gold color then edge highlighted silver and call it a day and then no one gives a fuck um, that's what it feels like at least that, that, the, there's the there's a big asterisk in my brain okay yeah hit me with you, it you cannot have a model that's got a ton of metals on oh it absolutely do yes. TMM yes okay yes I agree it's I, I it's, uh, the skink is a great example it had a couple of areas that were metallics and like the spearhead he did he didn't paint it with metallics he like he did it with like a, the glinty or whatever he painted it like a bright blue or something or whatever mm. and painted it like like NMM mm -hmm. almost so yeah, if if you're painting like old freaking Stormcast Eternal and you paint them all in TMM, like you ain't you yeah, you ain't going nowhere. You ain't going nowhere. Yeah, that's true. That's hundred percent true. Okay, my favorite entry from the unit category for fantasy was Lucas Wiggering, who got bronze with his lovely Skaven diorama and not I mean, so there's two reasons why. One, he's a member of the Chapter of Plastic Facebook group. So <laughs> Lucas official goody pee pee. Official. So, if there is one person that deserves to get more attention from this entire page of winners at Golden Demon, it needs to be Lucas. Absolutely. Obviously, he's the smartest one yes. of all of them. Now, if you either won a Golden Demon or you got a commended entry or you even entered Golden Demon, you should be like head over to the Facebook group and be like, hey, like count me as one <laughs> you know we need to get the get the army growing strong yeah um and to me it's all about did you enter yeah more goody peepees that are entering competitions you know that is how we grow our forces definitely <coughs> i think the i mean so i, I didn't want to bring this up only because it he was a member of the podcast but also it's such a striking diorama it's so fucking smart it, it is it's just like no one's just gonna look like that, right? No. This skinny wall of brick with three skaven, one perched at the very top, one mid-flight running down this what looks like, I don't know, 
either five in the sewer. six inch tall like wall yeah that's pretty tall so that's one midway down the wall running down the wall and the other one is splashing into the sewer at the bottom yeah. it's, it's almost like a, a slideshow of what this one rat is doing it's it's not it's three individual rats but it's so smart because it's so it's so unique the idea is so unique and it works so well for the subject matter as well yeah, which is this, which this, even gutter runners it totally feels like what the rat people do in the sewers all I day know, long. Dude, skitting around dude. they're just running along walls like they're goddamn morpheus and shit <laughs> yeah i mean yeah i, I mean it's just, and your eye follows the piece so well yeah again composition like having an interesting idea or having a forming the the basis of your piece around um the the true nature of what the models are is 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 only going to help you and i know i said that a base doesn't make your piece win but i almost think lucas's might be the exception to that rule because it's obviously really well painted well i think that but if he painted those things just as well as he did and then put them in three gaming bases next to each other on a on a black plinth i mean that fucking base does it man it's an interesting idea it it's we're t or i think we're too far away to see what the rats actually look like to make that judgment call but like possibly he put pictures up on the trapped in a plastic facebook group for all of oh, us closer see. ones yeah oh so we can go through although it is um com, you know compressed with good old facebook yeah so you can't really zoom in to see the super crispiness but. zuckerberg is just kind of crushing that image yeah all right um although i'll say this is an interesting thing too that i thought of when i saw this this is not the only example of it is like is three can you just do three for a unit no obviously you can because lucas did so what's the number and the number is what that equals a unit Hmm. You know, I kind of assumed it'd be something stupid, like the minimum unit size you can take them in the game. God, just punch me in the dick. Don't I know. fucking say that. I, but like that seems like a dumb thing that Golden Demon would do. Yeah. Um, there probably was a rule like that at one point. I hope it's three. Three seems right. Two is <laughs> two is a duel or close to a duel. One is a single figure. Obviously, I think it, it should be three. Only two if you progress immediately on two, three. <laughs> Six is right out. <laughs> too many. Because, um, yeah, if it's two, it's a pair or duo. Yeah. It's not a unit. Right. Our unit is two. Yeah. Our unit is three. I guess that would be a tri the tri We are the triad. We are the triangle. Each of us is a point and a side. Our unit. What are you doing right now? Are you, like, breaking down some kind of, like... Bro, I'm high on Dayquil right now. Don't <laughs> ask me. <laughs> yeah, the fuck? He's talking about shapes and shit over here, dude. Look, uh, I'm just dealing with how we measure shit in Kill Team, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, we got this lovely large fig from Infernal Arms, Dave Perryman. Uh, Vincey V pointed this one out as the most heavy metal looking entry of the bunch. And I feel like the more that I look at it, the, the what really sells that idea for me is like the, the skin of the giant squig on top and the bottom. Like those... Uh, those red highlights that like are pointed at you, the viewer on like little spotty highlights that, that, Ding. yeah. And then that combined in the framework of everything else being creamy AF, that really does sell it. So this is silver in large model yes. Warhammer Age of Sigmar. Yes. It is the squig hop, not hoppers. One of those, the giant squigs. There's two of them and there's squig, squig riders. Squig daddy. Squig daddy. Big daddy squigs. Uh, big Papa Squig boy <laughs> with, with little goblins on them. And this model um, is very popular for use in competitions. Why is that? We've seen a lot of people do it. Chris Suri did, did this. Oh, you're right. You're right. Um, There's a number of them, or at least a one or two more at Golden Demon. I just think that one, they're really well designed and there's a lot of character and interesting things to paint on them. There's a lot of movement and action. To it them. totally is. Yeah. <clears throat> and they're just pleasing to look at. They're just they're beautifully sculpted models. Sean, don't I look at the base. What about it? No mushrooms? More tuft love. Give me them baby tufts, bro. <laughs> where you buy them baby tufts, yo? <laughs> I want them baby tufts. You sent a link. What was it you that sent a link? Yeah, I did. I did. Is it, it if you sent me it was a gamer grass? No. So I asked that exact same question when I saw an old entry from actually a person who won an award in this category, I asked him, I was like, where the fuck did you get those, 
tiny ass tufts. This is before gamer grass, I think was a thing. Mm. And it was, uh, it was from a website that I, I linked to and is that one from it's Deu- German. It's German Deutschland website. again. Yeah, it's going to yeah. take 17 months to go on a boat to get here. Possibly. Yeah. Should we do a big ass order of baby tufts, bro? We sh- maybe we should. <laughs> I don't know if they're any different than micro tufts from gamer grass. So I think if you c- like kind of clump those together really closely, it would look, just like that. What if you clip them down yourself, like trim the hedges and shit? Or, yeah, or that. I mean, or they could just be right when you put them on. I don't know. Listen, if it was made by Germans, it's probably engineered to perfection. That's that's true. what we need to come to grips yeah. with here. It's killing me right now that I can't think of the name. Gavin used them on his Slayer sword piece too. Okay, I don't know if that's same brand, but he used Baby Tufts. Here's another. So this is another. Okay, this is another, another gold name and quirk. Okay, Baby, Baby Tufts. Tufts, dude. The, 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 my quirk? entire diorama, vampire diorama. Covered baby tufts. Cover the models of baby tufts. Yeah. <laughs> Just zombies of baby tufts. <laughs> the other thing is, it's very sexually appealing if the side of the black plinth creeps up onto the top of the plinth and there's like a, this is where the terrain stops. This is where the black begins. It does, does that all the time. I know. It's, it's, that's a very golden demon thing. I know. I was thinking about doing that on mine. Oh, yeah. You should definitely do it. Just lean uh, into it, bro. I think I've already placed down all the milliput that's not that way. How Mine's like it just could you molded to the edge. Molded. Um, molded. Also, why this looks so much like um heavy metal style is because this is by a gentleman that used to be on the heavy metal team. So if there's anyone that knows it and is not allowed to only compete in open. It's probably this guy. <laughs> and he's an uh, infernal brush is his name on. Uh, oh, I said infernal arms. My bad. Yeah, it's infernal arms. brush You're on totally right. uh, Instagram. And he's got a YouTube channel as well that goes through like how to paint heavy metal style. Obviously, gold in this is bananas. This is by Chris Clayton. You'll hear that name again later. Um Wait, what? He claimed in an interview that this took north of 400 hours. Oh, my God. Chris had another entry. Oh, yeah. I didn't even notice. Yeah, Chris Clayton. Um, so his pieces, I think, were roughly four to 500 hours each. Lovely. This is Croak um, on his whole, like, I don't know what you call that, like, menagerie oh. of the universe kind of weird shit that they have croak on but that croak is i don't know if that's the actual model or if he's changed it it doesn't look the same as the gw one yeah that's the same reaction that i had i was like have i seen this model before i don't know if i have it looks like it's definitely changed in some way i don't know if he altered it or sculpted it but obviously still painted to a ridiculous level yeah um but yeah that this was the one he painted for this competition over the last year okay okay um, and third place is David Aroba. Uh, interesting thing here of, with uh, Craig Nose, uh, big craggy daddy, uh, centaur man, uh, exquisite horny boy. Um, he, <laughs> uh, and this is just an amazing paint job. And David Aroba is obviously a phenomenal painter. But here's one thing I'll know about this. David Aroba is one of the few like professional names, professional painters we see listed on this entire list of Golden Demon winners. What do you mean by that? The big names, the professional painters, the... the oh, like the, one, a, the ones you don't you recognize. Recognizable names. And that doesn't mean like they're the best. That means that they're professionals and they do this for a living. Oh, do you know that for a fact? Does David do this for a living? I'm pretty sure he does. Because I kind of group him in the same category with Albert Moreto Font. In the same category with Maxime Pinau, David Soper, like these like w- amazing display painters that I've heard of on the internet. Uh, but um, maybe. Aroba, and Aroba does box arts and stuff. Oh, okay. So I considered him under the... He might. But what I'm getting at with that is kind of... I can get to my point here now since now is a good time as any. I think we're probably getting past the day and age of professional painters, amazing, amazing painters winning the majority of the awards and what we're getting to, if this golden demon is any indication is that the Chris Clayton's and the Alberto Moreto fonts are, are the future of, of 
professional competition painting. People that will paint one model for one year or will paint two models in a year and they paint every day or five days a week or whatever because they are putting in 500 hours because the the level of, of quality of painting is so high these days. I mean, it's ridiculous. So how do you separate the amazing painters like Sergio Calvo and Angel Geraldes and these people that do it all day, every day with the ones that are winning now is that Sergio's not going to spend 500 hours on a piece. And neither is David Roba. If, if he is a professional painter, like you're suggesting, he can't spend that much time. Yeah. On a and thing and I could me. be wrong. I could I, be I think, wrong. No, he is. That's what it says in his Instagram. I checked. Okay. So I think the only person that I think meets this criteria and it does exist is a person who is retired. Mm. You know, like they could literally paint models because they don't need to make money on it for like for a very long time. Like I know David Soper is retired and he has a time to paint models endlessly. But yeah, like people like people who have like a, a job, a normal job, they can't paint models all the time because they're at their normal job. Well, you can, you can, like you can be like, um, if they can, then so can we, <clears throat> but you have to have the ability to say, I'm okay with this is the model I paint this year. That is how you can do it mm -hmm. because you are spending 10 hours a week for a year that equals 520 hours. It that does. I mean, do you paint ten hours a week? I think the average painter is like, man, that's a pretty good amount of hours in a week. That's a pre that's a pretty good amount. Yeah, that's that's a lot. That's a. I mean, I probably I probably do that on like a week where I'm painting. Actually, um, I'm like well over that. But uh, mm -hmm. but my my point is, it's not to say don't compete. The point is to say you. It's not to say you can't win a golden demon. But like, if you are going to crush the gold, if you're going to get gold, if you're going to have a. a your name uttered in the possibilities for a go, uh, Slayer Sword. Slayer Sword, definitely. Yeah, you I'm you there. you yeah. have to paint a ridiculous amount of hours because it, it's a, it was an arms race and it started with the arms race of these people that just paint all the time because they're professional painters and they're just like their skill level gets so much higher that what they can do in a hundred hours <coughs> is so much better than other people. Then that this is all my own opinion, by the way, and yell at me if you disagree. At a certain point, the skill level people caught up one, I think, over uh, coronavirus times because people had more time to paint and more people were getting into it. And more people were really like diving into trying to improve their painting in the skill level with all the ability to get resources through YouTube, through Patreons, whatever, to increase your skill level quicker has just skyrocketed. So now the arms race of pure amount of time painted to become better skilled painter, the, that ground has leveled out. It's not perfectly flat, but there's a, now way more people with a high, high skill level of painting. Mm -hmm. So then how do you differentiate? You just more time, more time. Like I'm doing something that you cannot do as a professional painter because you don't have the time because you've got to do three box arts this month and you're, you know, you're posting something on your how to on your Patreon and you're maybe making a YouTube video and you're doing whatever you need to do as a professional painter to do that. But the exciting thing about that is, is that literally any goody PP out there that is willing to put in the time is willing to improve their skills and get to where their skill set is good and then just have the testicular fortitude to say, I'm going to stick with this until this blade is utterly perfect. And I remember talking to Gavin, um, the Slayer Sword winner at, at Adepticon. Um, it was like, Friday or something Friday evening. So this is well before we found out he won. And I was asking him a lot about his piece and his painting process. And he's like, I just, he's like the average, any average surface, any part of that, whether it's the skin, whether it's the, the tip of the spear, whether it's his headdress, it's like, I probably repainted and then repainted the average thing three or four times. He's like, I need it until it was perfect. And so do you have the patience and you know, the gumption to do that? And that is, 
one, it's like, wow, that is a, a big pill to swallow, John. But on the other side is like, if that's what you want, don't let anyone stop you to think that you're not capable because you're not as good of a painter as some of the other people. Well, you don't necessarily have to be as good of a painter if you just, you know, go full ball sack. And then guess what? By the time you're done with that piece, you're going to be a way better painter. Yeah. And that's the cool part about it. So that's my hot take. My hot take is gone are the days of just being an amazing painter and putting 50 to 100 hours in the piece and, you know, getting that $10,000 crystal brush check because that is what won at crystal brush. Yeah, that most, is most of them. That is true. I would say it's also a combination of a custom sculpt that was never before seen. Yeah. Um, Which I honestly did not like that element of Crystal Brush. Did Lan bring the tribute to yes. Crystal Brush? And yes. Th and that's an exception. I think that whole piece. Well, there are a couple of exceptions. A, yeah. Which was just like, you know, LeBron dunking on everybody. Yeah. Because it was the combination of Lan being one of the best painters alive and sheer amount of hours. Yeah. In that, in the sculpting and the, how big that piece was in the attention to detail and every in every surface but but carol's daniel craig terminator was a mountain of time as well mm. not only did he paint it and freehand the fucking shit out of it mm. he also sculpted the whole goddamn model so like he doesn't even uh, people have asked him how long that took and he doesn't even want to say he doesn't even he doesn't even want to think about it um so yeah no I, yeah you have a point i'm a little bit confused when you say the the phrase professional miniature painter. Are you saying that they have a better shot at winning? Cause worse. Yeah. Cause they have other things they need to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're on the same page. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, the, the water level constantly rises with the advent of easier ways to learn when we all have to right. be better. And the best way to do that is putting more time behind the brush. Yeah. Cause I, I, I think it's like, it's going to be a new, it's already has existed. And I, I think Alberto, is is a the, the prime example one of the first ones maybe not but the first one that 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 i was aware of um that did it this way mm. was like he he just paints to this ridiculous level but he does one or two models a year and like that's his thing and like i think that's going to be a whole contingent of miniature painting in the future maybe like, that's like that's going to be this group of people the people in that bubble are the people that are going to take home much of the of the awards. Mm -hmm. And if you aren't in that bubble, you have to hope there's enough scraps left over to get your silver or bronze. That's at the highest level of the competitions. <clears throat> that's at the Montes. That's at the World Model Expos. That's at the Golden Demons. Yeah. And like they, they each have their own like microcosm of like what they're looking for. Yes. So people at Golden Demon, the people winning there are like the best at that kind of thing in the fucking world, right? So it's like it's hard to measure up to, to that sometimes. Yeah. And I mean, there's very few, but it's definitely possible to cross the streams there because like Alberto stuff, he wins at Monty and he wins at uh, World Model Expo with the same thing that goblin mm. that one gold yeah know, oh you're right yeah you know so it's possible i mean when you're just that good <laughs> yeah um and and it, it crosses over where it's it's looked at in its artistry on on from those kind of totally different perspectives mm -hmm. which is great so yeah okay so there's my little sidebar here <laughs> um middle earth that elrond be popping bro yeah, the the weird bass thing he's on weirds me out. Uh, yeah, I didn't even like notice that. What the fuck is, is that? Elrond is on like this inverted mushroom bass that's actually rock. It it, it, like, it like it's distracting a little bit. It is for me. <coughs> yeah, once you point it out, it's kind of like what is going on here? Um, that gold enemy is very nice, and also I love like if you want to see like what I consider to be like, I always talk about intentionality. If you want to consider what I to be, what I consider to be intentional stippling, it's, it's this, like the green and the blue is like every dot feels like it's supposed to be where it is. Um, it looks very, it's like, it's a rough, but clean looking at the same time, you know, it's weird. Yeah. Like his, his, I was going to say pants, but those aren't like, I don't know the, his leg sleeves. Pantaloons. Um, his leg sleeves, like they have a texture. It's very, um, 
uh, a te- no, what's, what's the word? What's the word? It's, uh, I don't know. My brain doesn't work right now. But <laughs> intentional. It's very intentional that it has that texture. Yes. There's a little bit of a glint and there's like almost a shimmer of that when the light hits that that textured surface that is like it almost reads as gold. Yes. Which is very cool. I love this fucking Smeagol by the waterfall. And here's the here's why I love the Smeagol. You can't see it super good from this picture. There are other pictures that shot from above. You see the blood like swirling into the water ah. and like the the bit of I think it's the tail of the fish is sitting next to him. Yeah. So this is uh, this is the classic scene from uh, Lord of the Rings where Smeagol goes into the forbidden pool and fishes out a, a fish and starts eating it on a rock um, made into a diorama with a lovely little waterfall and Smeagol sitting on a rock. Looks really nice. Yeah. Good old... Good old, good Middle old. Earth. All right. All right. Let's talk. diorama. Let's talk about this motherfucking blood bowl diorama, <laughs> yeah. bro. What a smart idea. What a smart idea to use a backdrop in like a unique way that makes so much sense. So for the audio listeners, what we're looking at is someone took what looks to be a magazine cover from the fantasy football spike fantasy football journal for blood bowl. And instead of the cover art of the magazine being the Blood Bowl team that they're showcasing, it's actually figures and they're right in front of the magazine cover. So they used the magazine as the backdrop. Yes. Like, that is such a clever idea that I wish I thought of. <laughs> you know. I love that so much. And the the gold one here, it is, uh, what's that dude that you painted? The old timey metal dude? Orion. Orion. They, they, uh, Converted a Magnus the Red, the giant ass model, into him with yeah. some Stormcast doggy dogs, turned them into foresty dogs. I would love to see this model unpainted and unprimed. Like, I want to know what parts are kit and what parts are, you know, like uh, uh, green stuff or milliput or what, whatever he decided to use. Because um, I got to imagine it's like. I don't know, like, are all those legs, like, all sculpted? Because, like, I don't know of, like, branchy legs that are that fucking large, you know, in the range. Yeah, the, no, not the not the legs. I think that is all sculpted, but I think his right arm is of Durthu. Mm, okay, there you go, okay. <sighs> but I think he did sculpt where the tree parts meet the bicep. The cloak as well, the leaf cloak, I don't know if that's a real thing. What the heck, dude? I don't think it is. Yeah, that's freaking awesome. Um, yeah, this is a wild piece. There's a lot of busyness that my eye shrug- struggles to um, contextualize on the base. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. <clears throat> but that bright-ass green, it hurts my eyes. It's so bright. Yeah, it's blinging. Which is, I mean that in a good way. So, really well done. All right, let's get down to duel. Let's and, get to it. All right, and before we get to our Slayer Sword winner, um, let's talk about one of the most interesting pieces I think of that I saw from this entire Golden Demon, and that is the the bronze winner. And this is a perspective piece. So not new to Golden Demon is somebody smashing through a window. Um, that's That is a really cool and, and a kind of iconic captured moment. And yeah, there's a space marine smashing through a window, jumping out after a Eldar on a jet bike that he's knocked off it. But when I say perspective, this is he's up on like a fifth story window and the piece is actually not five stories tall. It's all angled down like you're looking at it at a very specific perspective to look like it's a very long building when in fact it's only like, I don't know, probably four inches to six inches tall. Um, and so if you view it from this very specific angle, everything lines up and it looks so freaking cool. You're saying if, are you, are, have, did you see pictures from a different angle that make it look not as good or something like that? I, I've not seen, I don't think I've seen pictures from different angle. Okay. okay. Um, but I, I can tell you from being, a, <laughs> being an architecture student that you do a lot of perspective drawings in architecture. So I did a lot of that, which is made me pissed off that I didn't think of this. Um, that uh, oh. when you look at something that from a very specific perspective to 
give the impression of something that it's not. If you take one step to the left or one step to the right, your eye recognizes that that's, that's not what the kind of optical illusion is being played. The optical illusion is broken. Are you saying that he sculpted it to look like this? He created this base so that it tapered from the bottom to the top? Yes. It's it's shaped like a V. Did he actually do that? Yes. So it's only this tall, but it looks like it's this tall. Fucking because, A, Ryan Allen. Yeah. So it's, it's met, he's he's playing with your pers- with perspective. The human eye, that's how human eye gets depth is based on, on that perspective and the yeah. angles of things. The other thing that's interesting is the very top of the diorama, you would expect to see maybe more of the roof. Yes. But instead it's just cut off. Yeah, that's like, a little interesting. Like like it's actually so instead of going flat like away from us, it's like almost like angling down away from us so you can't see it. And I don't know what that suggests about perspective, but it almost seemed like whoever took this photo just like went in Photoshop and kind of like erased that part of the building because I don't know why there wouldn't be a roof um it's because it's it's guiding you what the ideal viewing angle is sure yeah so what you want to where you're going to look at this perfectly is where when you like if you're looking at this in a glass case you're going to move your head up and down until that roof would be perfectly level behind there so you wouldn't see the top of it yeah and you wouldn't have your head too low to where you couldn't see the roofs of the ones below. And that's where the picture was taken as well. Okay. So it's it's a little bit, I, I get, you're right. It's a little bit odd, but it's it's forcing you into that perspective. Yeah. Where the piece looks ideal, which is really smart. Because if he does show the top of that roof, um, it it messes with everything. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, it was well, well thought out. Really good job, Ryan Allen. Yeah, that is a is a very cool idea to force that perspective um, with the the like the diorama making like choice. Yeah. I mean, both this one and the uh, the Skavens by by Lucas. Um, there's this fine line you walk between gimmicky <coughs> and doing something unique, and I think the big part that puts you in one category or the other comes down to can you execute in a way that doesn't lean into the gimmick but just rather you're drawn into the story that's happening and so you maybe don't even like realize it right away when you first see it just because you're you're drawn into how cool the thing is um and so i think both of them pulled it off so Mm. that's my thought there okay all right it's time to talk about Big Daddy Clayton. Yeah, we're gonna let's. Or do you want to hold it for the end? Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's let's we'll come we'll swing back to the Slayer Sword winner uh, at the very end, which is also this gold in duel. Let's quickly go down to fucking tiny yeah. airplanes. Great, they're tiny airplanes. Next, <laughs> I don't care about this shit at all. <laughs> Small scale is the small scale category. The small scale stuff I think that's cool is the stuff like Sam Lenz did for the USA one with a giant fucking warlord titan. I find that less interesting. I think if it's small scale, it should be fucking small. I want to see a 15 millimeter model. I want to see a single 15 millimeter model. I don't want to see a, a vehicle. Like that's not small scale to me. Dude, should we should we track down some fucking war master? Yeah. For like next year and yeah. do little fucking tiny war master? Yeah, like that... That is the spirit of that category. I mean, think I think Sam's uh, Titan is awesome and it's painted well, but it could just have gone in the vehicle category. You know, it's not to me it's that was small scale. And yeah, it's big. But obviously, it's scaled down, so it counts as being small scale. But I, like, yeah, I want to see a tiny dude. I guess it's more to me the fact that that is a much more interesting and cool piece to look at. That's true. Yeah, I see one airplane with a backdrop of space. I've seen them all. Um, Kinda, and yeah. that's just a personal preference. You know, yeah. that doesn't mean to say that these aren't painted amazingly because obviously they are, but it, it doesn't really interest me, especially because like, because so many of these that are entered are the planes and they're so limited in what you can do. I mean, we haven't seen a really c- creative approach. It's all a backdrop in and in a, the plane at an angle and then they paint it. Yeah. 
you know a pretty new category too so maybe that makes sense why it's a little bit stale in terms of creativity like we're seeing with this interesting perspective shifting <laughs> diorama idea but let's pop into the young bloods bro yo young bloods popping off these yeah. guys and gals whoever they are really good painters yeah i mean there's two big takeaways that i had in not having been to this one in nottingham the golden demon but having been to the one at adepticon this last year there's two big takeaways that i saw from um just from the experience of seeing the event one it seems like way more people in england and in europe had a fucking backlog had stuff in the hopper had stuff for years than america i thought that was going to be in the case in america and it didn't really feel that way it feels that way in england it feels like like the slayer sword winner piece was done like done done well over a year ago like a hundred percent complete there's stuff that people had for years and put hundreds of hours in okay um I didn't feel that as much in America. Um, And number two, they fucking represent with the young bloods over there. Yeah. Like we as parents need to do a better job in America to force our kids to paint. (laughs) Yeah. If it wasn't for the fact that I don't want to expose my daughter to like the ridiculousness that is me at Adepticon for four days. That, I think that's it. I think Adepticon is more of an adult affair. And we, I think we have mentioned this. hundred percent. You know, and this is a, this is a specific golden demon event. You know, it's not golden demon at Adepticon where there are people walking around inebriated. Yeah. And well, and like playing in tournaments from, you know, 8 a.m. until 10 p.m. And yeah. then open gaming till four in the morning. Yeah. 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 At the, you know, drunken bits bits bins <laughs> till the sun comes up and yeah. he, eating tendies is your first food at three in the afternoon and like it's a it's a whole experience at adepticon and this is a totally different event yeah and i'm really curious um because i know there are people that have been to both things before but like to talk to somebody that had been to both of these just within six months of each other like andy wardle Mm. And to say, like, you saw, you were experienced the most recent at Adapticon, you experienced the most recent uh, Golden Demon at Warhammer World. Well, like, tell me about the biggest differences, not pluses and minuses, not which one was better or worse, but like, what makes those events so different? And I think we probably wouldn't be surprised at his responses, mm. but um, I think they're just totally different events. Yeah. I agree. That's all I have to say about that. No, I totally agree. <coughs> no, no, no snarky Vince comments to make. Here's why you're wrong. Uh, and Vince could Vince could be the person we could ask about that, but Vince was a lazy bum and didn't go. Yeah, Vince, you lazy person. Yeah, Vince, you were so lazy you didn't even go. Wow, wow. How could you? Actually, I think he tried to get tickets and couldn't get tickets, and that's why he didn't end up deciding not to go. But then he said, like, I am. I'm kind of glad that I didn't because his whole um, summer and fall were just in a, just a whirlwind. Yeah. So, yeah. Here's why you're wrong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, Vince. Sorry, Vince. Please tell me what actually happened. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. right. Let's talk about let's talk about Slayer Sword winner Chris Clayton. Oh, you missed a one category, brother. Oh, Open. I missed a category. Open. Oh, what's open? Yeah. I mean, it's got, we got homeboy Daz, homeboy Darren Latham, uh, chalking up third place with his space dwarf. Yeah. Goody peepee, Darren Latham, <laughs> right? <laughs> One of us, Daz himself, uh, he won a nice little plaque that looked like he went to uh, team building exercise 99. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sad man. Why can't they just give him normal demons and just say you're not in the running for Slayer? Like, yeah. Why can't they give him a golden demon and just put googly eyes on it? Yeah, just to fuck with him a little bit. Just fucks with it, you know. And but just like use gorilla glue to to glue down the googly eyes so they can never be removed. Yeah. Um, I will say open is definitely an area where maybe you don't need to paint like an heavy metal like uh like you don't need to like jerk off to the heavy metal gods. Um, because the first and second place, I would not describe them as like 
in line with the rest of what's winning exactly? I don't, I, I, I don't know if I... I, I kind of came around after Adepticon on like what they're looking for in this category, just in general. Okay. And I think this is good examples of it. But like it screams Warhammer, the the gold. It's a the gold in open competition was a bust, a hand sculpted bust of a Tau. I mean, it's, it's not just, painted heavy metal at all. Painted very realistic. It screams Warhammer insofar as that it is a character from Warhammer. Yes. That, but everything in this competition is that, though. Yes. Okay. Um. Um. Yeah. But when you, I don't know. Yeah. And same with the with the Stormcast by David Roba. Right. Like that. That's painted <laughs> super stylistically, very kind of like Spanish, like European kind of style of painting. Um. But and it got second. It got second over Daz's piece, which is, you know, one of the progenitors of this style of painting, and, and painted immaculately right so as his piece i'm a little shocked you know it's like okay like maybe in open the rules are a little bit more lax as well also do you know how fucking big this tau bust is no it's like the size of a fucking softball really like not in volume but like in diameter it's like it's fucking big no so like painting that thing bruh I mean, I guess been when you zoom tough. in and look at the the quality of the paint job on the face, it makes more sense because yeah. it looks that looks real. Like looks, that looks yeah. like real freaking alien skin. Yeah, like um, that's creepy as hell. <laughs> yeah, dude. And also the the so much texturing going on in that white armor, all that scratching and chipping on the red parts. Like it's all like the the leather around his like his neck and his face is like this little face sock that he's in. <laughs> Um, like that just feels like I could feel what that I, I look at it and I know what that feels like if I were to touch it with my yeah, fingers. It, like it's it's transportive. The only thing I don't really like, and this is just a personal, it's just like my opinion, man. <clears throat> the red that's on his shoulder, I think it works. The red that's on his like transmitter on the side of his ear. Um, there's so much of that white chipping stuff. It, it's I kind of get lost in it a little bit. It's a little bit weird to me. Okay, I think a little a little overdone that everything is like a white edge highlight, a choppy edge highlight, and I think it's kind of kind of weird. But I'm just nitpicking. I think it looks amazing. Yeah, I got you. No, it's a valid valid uh, criticism. A little and, bit. and Daz told us that the competition in open was ridiculous. Like he was like, "There's 15 pieces that should place." Wow, I want to. I, I would love to see these pieces. That was something else I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Okay, let's do that, and then we talk about Slayer Sword. Okay. Um, Games Workshop never gave a full picture review of all the people that made commended or finalist pins for Adepticon. They never released those pictures. They took all the pictures of them. They took pictures of everything, and they never released it to the public. I know this because one of them would have been mine, and I really want that picture. And yeah. they never released them publicly. I'm being told that they're going to do that for this. Uh, whether or not that's true or not, I heard it from a couple different sources, but that doesn't mean anything for certain. Okay. Um, I want to see all the other stuff. And I don't care if you wait like six months to to, to share them all yeah. because you don't want drama and you don't want people like, wow, why the hell did this one place and this one didn't to yeah. blah, blah, blah. Like that does, that's that doesn't not an matter. excuse. Yeah. Like they should be shared. You took the pictures. They all made finalists. Like let's, there's so many cool things. I bet probably of my top 10 favorite models of this golden demon that just happened. I bet of my top 10, Probably half of them, if they showed all the finalists, wouldn't even be ones that placed. Maybe. But I, I just want to be able to look at them. Yeah. There's actually one that I added to my Instagram save list that I think you would like of Kato. Um, <laughs> that was dirty sounding. Uh, I wanted to I want to show you this in a future episode, but um, yeah, just seeing this model kind of made me think that same thing. I was like, man, what else are we not seeing here? Yeah, and I've seen some through Instagram, too, that I'm like, wow, that's an amazing paint job. And then I was yeah. like, oh, they entered this for Golden Demon. Right, yeah. Like, there's, a, there's a ton of them out there, but unfortunately, you got to do a bunch of digging. Have you seen this one or no? Uh, I don't want yes, you to look I at have. it much. Yes, I have. Yes, okay, I have. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, the face is amazing. From the, I, I like it because of all the darkness and blue down on the, the base, and it like 
go is up. Yeah, but bro, that face. <sighs> yeah, that that's vampire nice. right there. Looking at this is a this is a Victoria Verve miniature. I'm sorry, a Victoria Vera miniature. Mm. I'm sorry, Victor Vera. My God, I'm sorry. Anyways, one more try. Uh, yeah, third time's a charm. Okay, uh, you wanted to talk about something before we got to Big Daddy. I think I just did, didn't uh, I? Okay, I think you did. I, I think that was that was the extent of the. the yeah, there was like a, I want to see all the pictures, man. Yes, you took them. Yes, it's not it's not a lack of having the pictures. You have all the pictures. Yeah, and it's just more content for your Warhammer community <laughs> blog. Like it's just it's the lowest effort work that you could you could do or at the very least put them in a goddamn folder and let the wonderful people at golden demon compendium aka matt <laughs> let him have them and let him put them out there yeah yeah you know we want to see the people want to see the pictures and people who painted those things would probably be more validated and you know i know i would i would feel really good about like just like yeah that's my that's my piece that that it got commended and I'm really proud of it and I want other people to see it the people that weren't there or don't just follow me on Instagram like right, I want yeah. people to see it yeah and maybe even credit the people maybe. I don't know maybe put me a little Instagram handle in there holy shit what's that gonna do to your brand if you do that oh my god maybe you'll lose money or something I don't know yeah. you fucking won't <laughs> it's you a, won't it's an Instagram handle all right raging aside uh, Chris Clayton. The man, the myth, the legend. This was the guy that I had mentioned earlier that I asked about what fucking tufts he used on his Stormcast people. The first time I encountered this guy was when I first found his bust that he made. Um, do you know, Kirill painted a bust and it's a girl holding a gun like this. It's a, and it's a larger one. It's like a one to eight scale one, I think. And, she, and like all over it, there was like Russian like kind of like advertisements all over it and uh it's like red armor yellow like free hands i don't know if i've seen that it's like a limited edition bus you can't really get any more he made it and he painted it and he painted it in such a unique way um he has like a guide for it if i can find it i'll try to link it in this episode down in the show notes you real did or chris clayton uh, chris clayton did the way he painted skin was a, a, a total departure from how many painters paint skin it was like all about layers of transparency texture doing pores doing vein work doing like blood work like all this stuff um like it was kind of like yeah, we, like we're like that he built upon yes it was, it was kind of like what we see from people like uh, J.C. Hong. Yeah, that's Instagram. what I think of. That's what I it think. felt like. It felt like a, a middle ground between mini painting and that. Um, that was my first exposure to him. And then I found him again at Golden Demon painting Stormcast Eternal. And I found out that he did the gold by literally getting gold pigment and burnishing it onto the fucking model. Like, so he's just got, he's got this bag of tricks that's just a totally unique, such a cool painter. And so I was so happy to see that he won this. He's not on social media. Not really at all. Yeah. He doesn't have an Instagram. He's just a class every now and then maybe. Yeah. Um, just heavy, heavy hitter. And he yeah. puts in a bazillion hours on every piece. Right. And so his Slayer Sword piece is a duel of a mega gargant. So a giant of giants fighting a Hydra. I'm sorry if there is probably a different name for this version of building the kit. Instead of calling it a Hydra, it's a fantasy item or fantasy model, an older model, but it isn't plastic. Um, but it's a Hydra. It's a bunch of heads. And the tail of the Hydra is like half wrapped around the Gargant. There's like, there's a really good play. It, it feels like you're in the midst of this battle. Mm. Um, there's a lot of great movement in the piece. But to me, 100% what sells this piece, why this piece is so amazing, it just comes down to that, that resin pour of the water. <laughs> no, that's not the only reason. Yeah, I mean, it's, not, it's certainly not the only reason. I, I feel like none of the pictures probably do this piece justice <clears throat> of how well it's painted. But it's just so eye-catching, and there's so much movement in the water. Mm. Like, you can see the waves and how the, the, like, the steps of the giant... And the pulling this thing out of the water is like affecting the actual water around and like it it's not still at all it's just it's super super clear you can see his foot right through the water mm -hmm. you can see the, the details under the ground like a smashed ship and stuff yeah. under that water it's just it's super super cool it is it is super cool um and also i found his his flesh torio for this bust that he painted and i think the moment i, sh I show you you're gonna know instantaneously 
uh, this model. It's called a Hush. Oh God, yeah. So this is his sculpt, um, and it's a large bust. He sculpted that. I, I, maybe I'm wrong. I think so. But if I zoom into this kind of low res photo, you can kind of see what I'm talking about with the skin, right? There's just so much nuance going in on that. Um, anyways, That's ridiculous. Not to not to d- d- side track us a bit from this lovely duel that do you have any uh any idea of how many hours he spent on this thing did he mention that in whatever literature you were reading or listening to um so there's a good interview with him on the culture of paint or cult of no, not culture of paint but the cult of paint youtube channel okay and he interviews him at the event i think it was between 350 and 450 hours on this piece honestly that's impressive uh for i mean maybe it's not but like i feel like this is two giant fucking models yes. and they're interacting in such a unique way and then that resin pour is so intense because like this could take way longer yes so he talks about in that interview which sidetrack to this thank you to the content creators so his miniature art tv as well as um cult of paint um both did um, interviews and they did some there's a bunch of videos on YouTube of them breaking down different sections either in the case with is um, miniature art TV has a, a whole series of the different categories where they go around with a 6k camera at the case at the event and are just just showing you all the pieces in the case there's no talking over it it's just like nice music and just like letting you see the, the pieces now the lighting is still mostly shit because the golden demon cases are terrible terrible lighting but you get to see the quality of the pieces pretty well as yeah. well as interviews of different artists and that kind of thing but andy in a, interviewed chris clayton and they had a good chat about this and so not only to talk about how long it was but he talked about how he made the resin base and so what he did was he built the whole base and he put the gargant's feet on there as well so where the legs meet like the top of his like giant socks um <laughs> i guess they don't connect to the leg either that or he cut them off and so just the feet up to the calf were in there and he painted that entire thing he didn't paint anything else he painted only that and then he did the resin pour mm-hmm. and the reason why was because if it if it screwed it up he'd have to do it all over again yeah and might as well not attach to the rest of the figure yeah. so don't paint anything else until you get that right and he said this was first try so it looks freaking phenomenal. So, <clears throat> and I then mean, he, from there he can attach or he can paint them separate and then right. attach at the end. Yeah, yeah. Also, he didn't pour the resin and then it looked like it looks uh, more, much more went into it than that. Yeah, he made a mold upside down of what the wave shape and everything would be. Yeah, and then he, he like had to pour the resin and then put the base on top. Yeah. It's like doing it upside down. Yeah, yeah. That's how you get the actual movement and shapes of everything. Yeah. There was a favorite mini in the extended episode a while ago, actually done by uh, um, Max. Oh. Uh, Filet uh, of a little Tau drone that was flying by the water up, up a water plinth. And it was like there was a streak of water following the mm-hmm. Tau drone. Do you remember this mm-hmm. thing? And it did it the same way. He sculpted it in some whatever putty molded it and then cast it into clear resin and then attach it to the rest of the base to get that motion um really cool really cool effect he did that in a similar way is that what you're getting at? i think so yeah yeah okay. um max tell me how you did it max give us the goods give me the goods and then show me how to do it and then do one for me and then let me use that in golden demon and then take me to every bar in nottingham yeah and then invite me to your halloween party yes please all right we're gonna go to Matt. We're gonna crash his Halloween party. Yeah. Did I not tell you this yet? No. I better not do it. Say it on live on the podcast that we're gonna crash Max's Halloween party. It would not. Yeah, that it would defeat the purpose a bit. Yeah. Okay. We're totally not gonna crash his Halloween party. All right. Um. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that is it. We have thoroughly digested and vomited up to all you baby birds <laughs> the the golden demon that took place in Nottingham. Um. I'm ex- it got me excited. Honestly, that was the reason why not even um, because it had happened because all the buzz and all the stuff had started to circulate around this golden demon, which got me to get fire under my ass and get excited to start my diorama. And it reminded me of like how exciting 
you know, being at the event, having a piece in the case, looking at people's awesome works, talking to people about their piece, just the the whole like community around the cases at Golden Demon at Adepticon is such an amazing thing. And I'm like, I want to have a, a piece I'm proud of in there. I want to talk to people about it. I want to see what they have to say. I want to do that. I want to have that experience again. And if I'm going to do that, I need to start. And so it's gotten me excited. And um, I do think whether you think you're a terrible painter, well, you, whether you think you're an intermediate painter, whether you think you're a pretty darn good painter, um, find a painting competition um, that you can go to, ideally in person, so you can talk to other people that are, are you know, that are also putting in pieces. You can talk to judges. You can get feedback. You can grow because I don't know if I've ever talked to somebody at an event, whether it was a local one or at a big one that entered a piece and didn't go away, just like feeling energized and feeling excited. Yeah. You know, it's, even if you didn't, a lot of people will go to these things and feel energized to paint. Yeah. Cause it's just kind of like, there's just something in the water. Yeah. You know, it's just, they pump that happy gas. Yeah, dude. Everyone's just supping it. Yeah. And so don't feel like you have to do golden demon, but if you like have any inclination, I say, go do golden demon do it but any painting competition it's just so much it's it's what life is worth living for wow you know is that debatable <laughs> sure <laughs> <laughs> all right out of the news we got news <laughs> we got roman lapot made a little awesome video about how to judge or how he judge judges uh, miniature painting competitions i watched through it kind of gives you a a summary of what kind of competitions you might find out there uh what you might expect from judges uh in terms of what they're looking for and like the process of judging if you're curious as a budding competitive painter or someone who wants to run a competition and want some insight from a person who has been involved in many uh competitions judging many pieces watch the video yeah i i watched it as well um a couple takeaways I had. So, Roman, get out your notepad here. Um, <laughs> first of all, and this is not a slight. This is actually um, my takeaway was this is a very positive thing. There wasn't much in there that, like, was new information to me or, like, surprised me, which I think is a good thing because it was more reinforcement. I took away what he had to say is reinforcement. Um, validating, right? Right. Your that, own knowledge. The big things that I took away that he said, it was like, create not for what you think the judges want. Create for what excites you and what's going to give you the passion to put in the work to really make a piece you're proud of. Yeah. I'm like, like a soul by Gravelord diorama. Yeah. He's like, I can love them goddamn vampires. Man. Goddamn vampires. Man. Yeah. And so if you stay true to what really excites you, you're going to come out with the best final product instead of trying to do what you think they want and then you're just not, your heart's not in it. So that was one thing that I really was reinforcing. Um, but the other thing that, that was actually was a little bit um, eye-opening to me was how much he talked about how judges work as a team. Like it's a very team-oriented thing. It's a very team-focused thing and a good judging team is a team that works as a team. Wow. Yeah, they like he mentioned them sitting around and having like long conversations and stuff like that and like kind of consulting one another and things like that. I don't know if all competitions are run that way. No, they're not. I think ideally they're run that way. And I like to think the little gremlin in my brain says like Roman was like trying to get people to do that more and I if that was what his intention was, props to him. Chef's kiss. Um because I, I totally agree that a single perspective is is the right way to go about any of this. Um, and so I think I would happily um, enter any painting competition if I knew Roman was one of the judges because I'd felt like like he really holds um, the responsibility. Of something I got a lot from that video is the weight of responsibility and doing honor to all the work that people put in to create the pieces. And there's a lot, um, a lot of that, that it falls on the shoulders of the judges and they don't take that lightly. Yeah. Um, I totally agree. I, no, I didn't realize that until after you just said it, but yeah, he like, it's like his solemn duty. Yeah. To make sure this is done in his fairest way possible. That he knows how to do it. Yes. You know? And that takes as long as it takes. Yeah. 
you yeah. know? And he said it's been 10, 12 hour days yeah. of doing that. And it's like, you take it seriously. There's a lot of weight to that. And so I respected that a lot. So if you don't know a lot about miniature painting competitions, or maybe you've done one and you want to get a little bit more insight, that video is, is a great one to watch. Yeah. There's a thing in here that I think you know more about than me. Army Painter wanting your feedback? Um, so Army Painter recently put out a video on YouTube, um, which is con kind of viral. It's got a ton of views. Um, them just being transparent about um, wanting wanting people's feedback to improve their products. And they talked about some improvements they've already made because of the feedback and their continued um, drive to do that. And in that video, they, they directly mentioned that like people and, and on social media and in YouTube and stuff have called out things that are bad about their products. And then they show clips with audio of that shitting on their products yeah the video that you did <laughs> multiple, on my channel multiple was that one and i thought they had another one of my later video on my channel that all shit on their products and they used them and i mean like like props to you like you're 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 taking the shots you're taking the bullets and you're like let's put it right in your face and let's let's show you what we're talking about about the negative things people have to say and so not shying away from that. I mean, I have a lot of respect for that. Yeah. So, and saying, look, we're not going to pretend that the, um, that the imperfections aren't there. We're going to try to work on those. So I think it's good on them. Good yeah, on them. absolutely. I mean, and you're right. This video had popped off 142 K views. Yeah. And I think it's authenticity and the honesty. Uh, absolutely. You know, so it's amazing. Uh, next thing here, GW Arata Votan came before the book came. That always feels bad. That kind of happened too with the uh, uh, Lumineth Realm Lords, right? The, yeah. The book was out of out of. Uh, what am I trying to say right now? Well, they had two. Oh, they, they had to release two books of Lumineth Realm Lords. Oh boy. There's oh, you're right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah, it was outdated before it came. We don't got to spend much time on it. We thought we'd mention it because we, we, we talked about it last time, but that gets kind of a feel-bad moment. But let's talk about something much more interesting. Citadel uh, making new tools. They had versions of these. They just improved them. Uh, dude, the one that I love the most, bro, is I think the Mold Light Scraper has a base rim cleaner built into it. Yeah, okay. So... You have these things. I have these products. Yeah. I just released a video as a release of this episode of the podcast. It should be just a couple of days ago. I released a video. I didn't know what that... I thought that was a bottle cap opener. <laughs> so you, I don't know what... That's what it looks like. I didn't know what that part was for. So I didn't go over that in the video because I'm like, I'm going to just look like an idiot because I don't know what the hell this is for. Um, I saw that's what it's for. I, I mean... Did you give it a try now that you know? No. I don't because I don't know why you'd need that but yeah it's kind of like at what point am i using this like when i when my basing stuff is on there and i want to scrape the edges clean when stuff is wet to scrape paint off like what <laughs> when am i using this thing so my big takeaway on this and you can watch my video to get my full like because i do a full in-depth breakdown where i use them all and i compare them to the tools that i currently use that are my tried and true tools for each of these purposes and i give them a head-to-head comparison um and so my biggest takeaway is oddly enough the quality of each of these tools is much lower than the last ones they did oh no like they they had heft they had weight they had high quality products these are mostly plastic now um the oh. old mold line remover was that machined metal you know on the on the edge and that metal ran all the way through the handle so it was one solid piece of metal. It's like a katana. So the katana blade goes all the way through the haft to the end. It is one long piece of metal. That's yeah. how it gets its strength. A lot of swords do that. There's a term for it. I forget what it is, though. Yes, there is. Full tang? Full tang. I think that's what it is. Get that full tang, wu tang. Woo! And, um, and so, and this one is just like that little piece of metal and it's a big plastic handle. And they're oh, just, my full tang fucking mold line scraper. Bro, I want fuck, that full bro. tang. Give me a goddamn samurai sword. <laughs> 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 there is some aspects of them that are actually respectable, but some. I think they copied well, the right people on some design elements. But if they still cost twice as much as 
yeah <laughs> dried and true ones i don't know yeah I, I i like the exacto blade with the knurling at the bottom so you can loosen it at the bottom and not at the top where like the blade is that's mm-hmm. safer and nicer again that's been around for a while though and the cutters they have they look so i've been eyeing up something called shear cutters uh because I, I always thought like it'd be so much nicer if like my clippers were long and thin yeah so it could kind of get into nooks and crannies and clip stuff away um and i, I bought god hands recently for my at-home station like the the lauded sprue clippers yeah. and uh they got the thing that you see on tamiya where like that kind of like a chunky little hinge section but then when it tapers down into the actual cutting area they get incredibly thin and tiny yeah so i was like maybe i don't need shear cutters if these work this way and i've been happy with those so far but i saw those on the gw site and they look like shear cutters they're like long and thin things but they they didn't work for you um no they do that really well okay the 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 sprue clippers are the best of the four tools um, the only negative I had to say about them, not knowing the prices, by the time you see this, they probably have the prices revealed. They, I asked for the prices <clears throat> because that's a big part. That's a major part to me yeah. in how I reviewed them. Yeah. Um, not knowing the prices. The only downside I had for those cutters is they aren't nearly as sharp as the Tamiya ones or the God Hands. Okay. So you... You know, you have a feel with the sprue cutters of how much are they just cutting and how much are they like pushing, kind of crushing, the, pushing. Yeah. yeah, they're 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 not sharp enough. Okay, um, they're solid. They're not bad, and I really like how big the handles are because those little ones, the little Tamiya ones, and the little um God hand ones, the actual thing you put in your hand is so freaking small that, like, when I was was building my 120 zombies for that video. I had like fucking vulture claw cramps in my hand because the clippers were so small. Interesting. And so these are much bigger and they're much more comfortable. They're very ergonomic. Um, okay. They're, very, they're a very smooth action on them. Okay. That's nice. They're good. They're very good. Um, they were just, they're not as sharp as the Tammy ones. Okay. A um, little note here from James, our, our writer. GW releases free rules for Kill Team Special Forces. And he says, just including this because I'm so goddamn happy about this free rules kick GW is on, even if just to catfish you into buying more products is totally working for me. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Touche. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. They did Keep that it with, up, the, with the War Cry as well. Yep. I'm, I'm Actually, on the back. That's good shit. We, we love that. Um, the, uh, the new Underworlds box came out. And, but boy, howdy, are we getting. New seasons of Kill Team and Honor Worlds left and right, and it ain't three months apart. I know. They're fast. I know. Like, what's going on? Anyways. I, uh, I don't care. Don't stop it. I, I mean, if I actually played this game, I'd, I'd care. I, yeah, but nobody does. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, it's just, a, it's the best models a company makes. Like, it's not, it's, even a, it's not even a fucking question. There's the best models. True. Yeah. Also, speaking of the best models they make, bro, that's Skeleton. Oh, the Skeleton Ooh! Leader, bro. Yes. Yes. With with Halgrim, with the mounted White Lord, with this man, we're getting some pretty stellar boner boys out of GW yeah, as dude. of late. Yeah, the best boner boys aren't actually boner boys. No. Like yeah, the, actually. Like, like the Osiarch Bone Reapers are like C squad level <laughs> skeletons versus what's that make you sad? No. No, because you have like a fully painted army of boner boys. Yeah, I'll sell it. Someone want to buy it? <laughs> You'll sell it, bro? How could you? Dude, don't sell it. Okay. I won't allow it. Okay. If actually, if you sell it, tell me. I'll buy it. Okay, $7 million. Okay, no. But also, no one take that price. <laughs> <laughs> um, It feels really cool to play it with the painted army. I've only played with them like two or three times, and it, it feels really, really cool. Yes. But yeah, like the scale. Okay, in my defense, at that time, there was like, other than Ghosty Boys, like they hadn't put out a whole new army for death, and I was just so excited for a new army for death. Had I known they were going to come up with all these other awesome new ones for the my true love, which is, <laughs> which is the Legions of Nagash, a.k.a. Soul Blight Gravelords these days, um, I never would have bought that army. I would have just done this. But you don't know the future. I was excited. And I got them all painted, and I'm fairly happy with how they yeah. turned out for a quick paint job. As far as I'm concerned, if you got them painted, like, 
No harm done. No harm, no harm. Uh, we got a new release from Monument Hobbies. They have just come out with their wash line, uh, the start of their wash line with three colors, black, brown, and flesh. I do have these, and they say that more colors are coming soon as well to their full wash line. Um, I do have these. I have not had a chance to try them yet. I'm looking forward to trying them. Um, and so if, if it's any indication of the rest of the products in their line, I really hope that they're really good. The videos I've seen on them, they look really solid. It would be great if there was good alternatives for instead of having to spend $75 on a bottle of null null oil. So Yeah. Uh, we got something new from WizKids, Icons of the Realm. Speaking of boner boys, uh, we got Undead Army. They're cool painted figures for your D&D games releasing in November. Uh, the bit of news we're most excited to talk about um, there's more battle tech coming out. <laughs> uh, up to 50 new minis are on the horizon after the success of their Kickstarter clan invasion produced by Catalyst Game Labs. So if you like the world's ugliest robots, have I got a deal for you? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, sad news. Mr. Lee's minis is going out of business. They're making their last sales either... I put this note in here a while ago. Maybe they are already out of business. Um, but uh, yeah, they're doing their last sales, which this is a little sad. This is a this is a kind of a a European web store that uh, took a bunch of different smaller sculptors, like even ones that didn't have their own platform, like Alexander Biblioff, and they would sell their custom sculpts on the website. So a little sad to see them going. I don't know if it was uh, a choice a personal choice or a financial choice, something like that. Um, but yeah, it's sad to see them go. They're a part of uh, miniature history. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Lee's minis um, are, they were the place to go because you just didn't know where to find these things. And it was a place where you could go to sell and then go to like discover amazing sculpts. Yeah. Uh, sad to see them go, but um, hopefully it, there's, it means there's just so many good places out there and people are all aware of them now that it's just kind of a, natural way of the dinosaur i don't know yeah so big news peachy left games workshop mm-hmm. i took some notes i watched like a podcast i think he was in he was there for 21 plus years mm-hmm. what the fuck well he started like everybody starts at the retail at a retail store he did he said that and i was like man they all start that way they do that is how companies um that is how you can keep your bottom line for your price of labor really low and if um if you find a company (laughs) i've seen this in many industries that they just want to promote from within and to slowly work you up the ladder it's how they can keep paying you fucking nothing for a job you should be paid so much more for so good on him for uh for leaving and um and i wish him all the success in yeah. his new venture he's joining the painting phase is the name of the channel yeah <coughs> youtube channel which is relatively small right now um i'm sure it will grow um they already have a video out there with an interview with peachy on there with one of the other hosts and they have two tutorials they have one painting the navy imperial breachers and one painting the crute from the into dark kill team box mm, i am crute yes i am crute um yeah so focusing on fast efficient painting um my commentary is that the videos are largely GW products, GW process, GW style with the occasional army painter cameo mm-hmm. um, and blooper left in. It's it's very similar to when Duncan left because it was like, oh, GW stuff, but that's an army painter web palette. And it's kind of like, oh, but this is all the same, though. Yes. Um, so, I'll, you know. I want to challenge them, but I don't want to challenge them at the same time. Like, if that works for you and that's what you like, do it. But if there's something else that you think you want to explore and are afraid to because you're concerned people aren't going to like it because your your audience is largely from Warhammer TV, I would say fuck that, you know? If there's a different thing you want to use, a different model you want to paint, a different tool you want to use, do it. Please do it. But if... If all you want to do is paint GW stuff with GW products and GW style, keep doing it. I, I I don't I don't I don't want to make you do something you don't want to do. But I want to see I want to see you guys really unchained. Yeah, I think we should cue the Shia LaBeouf uh, meme right now. Oh yeah, do it, just do it. But yeah, again, because I know Duncan like he paints like 
Well, he's been doing it more. So the more he's going on, he's like painting like historical stuff, like Flames of War stuff. So he's he's getting there 100%. Yeah, um, Peachy, I, it's your turn. And I'll say, when, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. when we were over in Nottingham, um, I got to spend some time with Peachy. Uh, I ate lunch with Peachy. Uh, Peachy's a funny fucking dude. Dude, yeah, in that podcast he, episode, he was funny. Like, he's got a personality that I was like, and I said to him, I was like, Peachy, I would, uh, based on the videos, I would never know that this was you. And he just kind of laughed. Yeah. He's, he's like, you know, we got to do things a certain way. And I'm like, I, I totally get that. I totally get that. But I hope that continues to to show itself, to, to show his personality and his sense of humor. Yes. And um, and, and like that that's an important part of it. So, And I'm sure he's going to do it. I'm sure he's he is. one of the reasons. Yeah. Some of the bloopers left in definitely show a little bit of comedy. So that, that's the beginnings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're getting closer to the holiday season, which means one of the most important um, product releases of each holiday season. Now, apparently this is a thing is coming to us. And that is the Warhammer 40 K candle collection um, announced are more candles, more scents, more boogers from Nurgle. <laughs> All of these things are coming to you and could be under your stocking or under your Christmas tree and in your stocking this year. Are you excited? Scott? No, not even in the slightest. I smelled them. I smelled the candles. <laughs> uh, not these new ones, but I smelled last year's candles. Uh, they smell like generic fucking Bed Bath & Beyond candles. Bro, my wife, every Black Friday, stocks up on Bed Bath & Beyond candles. You get that deal, man. So, I think it's buy one, get one. So. Oh, yeah. You get them, do you get them uh, wood wickers? You guys ever do oh, that buddy, wood wickers? You better believe our candle tech is way advanced. Yeah. See, now I, in 2022, it's crazy. And our old house, I'd buy the, I had those wood wickers everywhere. I love them wood wickers. And then. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't say it without stuttering, so I don't want to say it, but it sounds so funny when you say it. Um, but now in our current house, which we've been at for like 10 years now, um, we have two wood burning fireplaces in our house. So I just act like a, like a like a lumberjack and I go out and I chop wood and I burn wood fires. And then my house smells like a, like a beautiful smelly a little bit of cherry wood, wood work, wood wickers. Uh, it, does, it, it, it smells like wood wickers all the time, <laughs> dude. Doesn't it feel so great to chop fucking wood sometimes? <laughs> it does until you do it for about 20 minutes and you realize how much of a workout it is. Yeah. It, you, it kicks your ass. Do you use the sledge type ax or do you use like a traditional ax? No, you don't use your traditional axe. You use a wood splitter axe. Yeah, which, yeah. Like one of those big heavy ones. Yes. Yes, that's what I used to. Yes, yeah, so you have to be careful. Got that's what I used to when I chop wood every every day. You, I chop wood like once a year. You um yeah, you gotta use a you gotta use a the sledge ones, the heavy ones, but you gotta make sure you stretch first. You will hurt your back. Yeah. If you're if you're not careful. Um your lower back. So yeah. yeah I do that. Um I usually like to split wood when it's cold out. You usually want to do it when it's cold because oh. that, uh, all the moisture in the wood is frozen. Yep. And then they split easier. That's Otherwise, true. if there's moisture in there, you try a, it's a humid day out in the summer and you're out splitting wood mm -hmm. and you, it, it takes forever. It's miserable work. Yeah. So. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Every, every fall, my parents had a wood burning stove in their house. They still do. Um, but every fall we would, we would begin that process where my dad would chop wood and I'd put in a fucking wheelbarrow. Yep. Bring it to the garage, stack it, yep. walk back out, grab it over and over again. And then he, when he was tired, then I did a little bit. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's a good workout, especially in the winter when you can't get out and do a lot of different things. Like you go trunks out there, wear about four layers of clothing. And then about every 15 minutes you take off one layer cause you're sweating like a pig. <laughs> um, but yeah, I got a, I got a woodshed. You ever, you ever want to hang out and have some bonding time, dude? Why don't you come on out? Um, we'll split wood. I will go all behind the woodshed. Are you talking to me right now or I'm, talking to the, the goody peepees? I'm talking to you. Right? Well, any goody peepees wants to help me split wood. <laughs> my woodshed is full and uh, we're gonna, I'm going to have to refill that. So I need to split and then put into my garage because my garage is now almost empty with my wood section. So I got to split and put in for the, for the winter season. So mm -hmm. you, know, if you ever want to get a workout, come on over. All right. I'll put you to the work. <laughs> 
Thank you for staying all the way to the end of the podcast. We appreciate you. If you like our podcast and want to support it, there are many ways to do it, uh, namely supporting us on Patreon, which gets you access to an extended episode. Uh, you can also buy our merch from our Teespring store. You can watch our podcast episodes with uh, ads enabled. We run an ad every 30 minutes. But if you don't want to spend your dollars, you can support us by um, sharing our podcast with other uh, hobbyists, uh, giving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever you watch podcasts. Yeah. Uh, you should also join the Goody PP Nation. Absolutely. Over on the Patreon. Um, you could see an extended episode of the podcast. I don't remember if you've said that yet or not. You said it earlier in the episode. Yeah. But if I say it seven more times, you'll remember. <laughs> so we're going to see you back here again real soon. Until then, we'll catch you on the Liberty Flop.